Like you're in St. Louis. Are you in St. Louis? I'm in the Midwest. We just we met online. So okay. yeah, yeah. yeah. We're, we're online best friends. All right. That's great. <laughs> exactly. If you ever actually see each other in person. No, 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 no. Been that, doing the show. That's so, for like, We don't do that shit anymore. No, yeah, know. that's gay. No. Yeah. Yeah. We don't leave our rooms. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm a, I'm, what am I? I'm no fruit. Yeah. Okay, great. So, uh, yeah. All right. But, well, let me, I'll be, I'll shut up. Let me know what you have to do. Yeah, yeah of course. Of course. So, Brian, just want to say thank you so much for coming on Miramus. It's an honor to have you on. You know, we want, I've wanted you on for a long time because I've listened to just so much of your, uh, Let's say your radio, your podcast you did with Kevin Brennan. It was a huge hit for a long time. You guys were killing it. Yeah. I just want to say thank you so much for bestowing us with your presence today. Thank you for thank you for having me. It's great to be here. So I'm happy to I'm happy to be part of whatever the hell this is. So let's do it. <laughs> so I, shirt I, on I, or shirt off. So I ask my shirt on or shirt off. Shirt off, shirt off. Take that shirt off. Let's we'll see them tats, yeah. man. Let's do it. All right. I love the yeah, see, I love your <laughs> tattoos too, dude. That yeah. shit goes hard, bro. What is that yeah. shit? Well, let's see. Uh, this is a there's a swastika. Can you see that one? No. Um, this is a uh, this is Richie Rich, and uh, I got this a year ago <laughs> because I was visiting. I have a half sister that kind of showed up in my life a few years ago, and yeah. she and her husband relocated to Myrtle Beach, and I was so bored and I had nothing to do, and I was like, let me see. I'll just go get a, a Richie Rich tattoo because uh, there's this artist named Alec Monopoly. Who makes these giant? It's like graffiti, but it's like Richie Rich and with Daffy Duck, and they're like banging women on like billiard tables, and it's like hundreds of thousands of dollars. So I've always liked Richie Rich. I like the idea that like Richie Rich is the richest boy in the world, and all of his friends, he has these little friends, and they're all like shit poor, and they all live like in these like like communes, a, like a shanty town, like out yeah, like yeah. see like outside of like. Uh, you know, somewhere in South Africa or something. And I'm, I, even when I was like six years old, I'd be like, can you just like give them like a little money? They don't have running. <laughs> I, right. like, I just love how he, he was so like, he was like, I mean, like, everything he had was like his dog was named Dollar anyway. But so that's what this is. And this is because I wear a lot of Lacoste shirts. This yeah. is COVID and I was bored. And then I, I don't know. This is some what Irish bullshit. That? This okay. is Brian Baru. It's just, this is all, it's all nonsense. None of it really means anything, but those are the best just, tattoos. Yeah, that was it. And then, of well, course, like, their swastika is all here, but you can't really see them. They're, they got those <laughs> in prison, you know. They, they're, right. And they're, yeah. they're not really – they're brands. I was branded, you know, because oh, I was – yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, God. You know, I'm still on – a lot of those guys I'm still in touch with with Facebook. You know, I mean, I never saw their faces, but – Because they're blind, like, but yeah, yeah. Sweet, sweet <laughs> racing. <laughs> So, yeah. Well, dude, you, you were rocking that like Lacoste lifestyle forever, bro. And like, are you into Vineyard Vines? Well, I'll be honest. I Vineyard Vines is like almost a little too on the nose. I go for, I go into a deeper cut, like J Press. Um, matter of fact, I, I just got a new embroidered belt today that has the American flag. Yeah. To answer your question, people give me Vineyard Vines stuff and I think it's terrific, but like, yeah. I really, I like, I like to get under, I like to get under the hood. I'm, I'm like, I'm like somebody who like, if they, like, I like the VHS tape. You know, people that like vinyl are pretty annoying. You know what I mean? But if mm -hmm. they're, if, I if love like, vinyl. I know. I'm sorry. <laughs> I know. I don't know. I get it. I, I, I do understand the aesthetic of it. You know what yeah. I mean? So I, I can, I do understand it. I'm not, I guess, I'm not really judging. I just think people who are like the sound, the tone of vinyl, like the I, analog, bro. It's all about I the know, analog, man. Oh no, no, it's like okay, I guess. But my point is, is like I'm like that. That I'm like I go there with all that preppy stuff. But again, I don't take any of it like that seriously. It's just kind of like I think it'd be funny if. So that's it. Right. Plus, when I was a kid, I grew up like pretty lower middle class. So. Yeah. I, I'm, a, I'm a kid of the 80s and the 80s like I was obsessed or everybody was obsessed with like you know like polo and all that bullshit and I can never afford it so you know if you show I don't know if you ever heard the story but I I went to a middle school we used my dad's third wife's address because I lived in a really shitty part of Baltimore yeah. and we used my dad's third wife address so I could I could use that address to go to a Baltimore County um, middle school. So I showed up and all these fucking kids, they all knew each other from like kindergarten. Right. And I, I had a pair, they used to have these shorts called jams. Do you guys remember jams? No, they I'm, were like, I'm from the well, late nineties. Okay. 
they they look like um they look like swim trunks. So they had a, a drawstring, and they said jams J A M S on the bottom. They were kind of like Quicksilver or O P. They were like mm. colorful shorts. And so I remember my first day at school, I show up. Nobody knows who I am, but they could smell that I was like I was not one of this is not like the other. They could, they could smell the poor. Yeah, exactly. So this kid looks at my shorts and he goes, "Are those jams?" And I was like, "Yeah." And he goes, "Why do they have a Z?" Like they're supposed to be J A M S, and I was done. That was it. Like that was that's all I needed to be called out for me not having. So now, like I'm obsessed with, uh, you know, like I, everything's got to be like the best bullshit designer, the country Gucci, club Obama, lifestyle, country uh, aesthetic. Club. Yes, the aesthetic of it. I, yeah, I mean, I will. But it, but again, I'm so full of shit because like I'll get like Eddie if like I buffed Eddie's balls because. He'll take pictures of himself for social media, like flying off to a gig. And I'm like, you're only taking a picture because you're in business class. Like if you were sitting with your elbow touching somebody else's elbow, you wouldn't have taken the picture. Like, so I'm full of shit fundamentally, but I mean, anyway, so please go ahead. But, have- okay. So I want to touch on Eddie if, cause you, you bust on my scene back when you appeared on Jim and Eddie talking shit, which I think is still one of the best shows of all time. And yeah. you you came on you came on mid run. Uh, yeah. I love Jason Hour. I want to uh-huh. ask about him at some point. But you came on the scene and you came uh, as a trailblazer, wearing those like pink polos and pink. Uh, you had all those pastel colors, and you were the rich guy. And you were yeah. also a trailblazer in the sense that you were into trannies before it became cool. That's hot, uh, dude. Oh, You're- go on. Uh, <laughs> trannies yeah. are hot, man. Well, by the way, it's trans guys. I'm not going to sit oh. here for hate speech, okay? All right. <laughs> no, no, I'm pro trans. Like, trust me. Yes, yes, yes. Oh, all right. So, easy, easy there. I'll um, scream it. Well, you know what's funny? Okay, it was funny because Jim used to always say, uh, Jim Jeffries, who used to say that uh, he's like, you dress like Easter. You look like Easter. Um, but uh, yeah, it was the funniest thing because, I mean, I'm not going to tell the whole story, but like basically, you know, what had happened was, is I used to sell drugs and there was this guy named Mark McKelvey and he called me and, um, you know, I ended up having this experience with this transgendered, uh, you know, flight attendant from Australia. I mean, the whole thing sounds so absurd out loud, <laughs> but it was like a real thing. And, you know, I, I, I do talk about how the man-made vagina couldn't accommodate you know, my girth and length. And so I put my hand in and it did feel like frozen gummy bears. Like, I mean, cause I, use, I love gummy bears. And when I was a kid, they put them in the freezer because right. there's humidity. They, they could, they could maybe melt. Although little, little, little fat titted kid that I was, it wasn't like they stuck around long enough to actually melt. But so I remember thinking to myself when I had my hand in there, just trying to push all that, which inevitably I discovered was had to be scar tissue um, mm. over to accommodate, to kind of just get around it. Um, I remember saying, oh, this is like frozen gummy bears. And so when I told that story, I had already told that, like there's something called the Fringe Festival in Scotland, which I was a part of tangentially. And I told that story at a storytelling show there. So by the time I had gone uh, and Eddie asked me to be a guest on the show with Jim and he and Jim at the time lived together. And I was like, yeah, sure. I came down and it just sort of showed up. The story sort of, arrived organically it wasn't like before the show eddie was like okay you're going to talk about transgender and that experience you had and blah 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 it just kind of like i don't even know how it popped up no pun intended but actually she was she was close she was close oh, um, damn, bro. I think it's that i do feel like i mean i'm very happily married and everything and right. I'm gonna be honest, like like i know that you know i don't know if you know joe de rosa right joe yeah like joe and i are very good friends and we we talk like i don't know twice a day, you know, and we talk a lot. And, um, which is funny to me because when I was initially, I know I'm all over the place, I'm sorry, but like, initially I met Joe because I was doing this live truth or dare kind of show at a place called the Valerie Poetry Club, um, which is now closed, but it was this great venue. And the reason why, the reason how, or or how I met like Jay and, and Joe and Kurt and, you know, that, that kind of like, um, class or generation of comedian was because I did this thing where I played truth or dare with a live audience. And I would find comics at the time, Boston comedy club. And I would say, Hey, I'll give you 40 bucks 
to open the show, you know, do like, you know, 12 minute spots and whatever before the show. So that's how I knew Rick Shapiro, who was older than everybody, but Kurt and Joe. And so I, I had, I had met Kurt and Joe. And then when I moved back to New York, like 13 years ago, I, Kurt had, Kurt was still around, but he wasn't that easy to get a hold of necessarily. And I'm a real, I have dogs. I'm like a real chatterbox, you know? So I would call Joe and then Joe said to me once, he goes, Hey Brian, you know, like, listen, it's cool that we talk, but like, I feel like you call me too much. And I was like mortified. I was like, Oh, well I'm like, I'll make That's it really rude. Well, I mean, yeah, listen, number one, like most comics it's like an asperger thing you know what i mean like it's almost like i don't listen if you're i don't know how friendly you are with any stand-up comics but like i'm super friendly they're not really in terms of social skills like it's not really yeah Yeah. and joe's actually one of the better ones and he's gotten better but i was just like oh joe listen i'll make it really easy i'll just never call you again and so i just like hung up and then he we started, it wasn't like a big fight or anything, but I was just like, all right, listen, I don't want to bother somebody. So I hung up and now he'll call me sometimes four times in one day. And I just think it's funny because I'm always like, oh, Joe, I want to be like, I'm sure he probably doesn't even remember it, but I'd be like, Joe, you're calling me too much. And he'll be upset sometimes like, hey, I called you and you didn't call me back. I'm like, wow, this is, wow, how the, uh, how the dynamic has shifted. But I mean, I love talking to Joe, but my point is, is now I feel like with trans and I don't know what you're necessarily into, but everyone likes, everyone likes the equipment in addition to everything yeah. else. Yeah. yeah you, exactly. got the, you got the tits, you got the ass, you got the asshole. And then, you know, yeah. if you like the but cocking I, dick, there you go. I feel like <laughs> cock and balls. Yeah for, yeah. for me, like that's the bridge too far. You know what I mean? Like, I don't know. Like I would, that would be all, no pun intended. It's hacky, but that'd be a hard thing to sort of navigate because Dude. I feel like I spend the entire time just yanking it aside. I mean, bro, bro like, some of these trains are traditional even have apples with the dick and everything, man. It's crazy. Right. Sorry. Some of these trainees don't even have the Adam's apple. And they got a huge cock. No. It's crazy. So, and that is how I, with with my experience, and again, this is like almost thirty, probably a, over thirty years ago that I'm talking about. So the technology's gotten much like you know when i was with this uh young fella you know we were still calling refrigerators ice boxes you know <laughs> long, long time ago. Right. i mean warsaw was still smoldering from the bombing of the luftwaffe you know like yeah. so uh, but you know now i feel like the technology has gotten a lot better but and i've had like emma rose has done the show that i do now and i've had i just i would if for me i, I for me, it's like if I was single and I was out there, I don't think it's something that I would necessarily be like, especially if I had like jerk, jerk a girl off or something. Like, ooh, I don't know. For, it's a lot for me. It's a lot for me. So I don't know. Maybe I'm weird, there's some things that are too beautiful for this world. You know what I mean? I'm willing to say that it's on me. But like I asked Joe when he hooked up with that girl at Skankfest, at Skankfest, I was like, when you had to engage the equipment, like, did you enjoy jerking her off or did you just have to kind of always move it around? Was it always knocking around? You know what I mean? You always had to like pull it up. And he was like, no, it, it was fun to jerk her off. I was like, all right, I guess. Okay. <laughs> you <laughs> know what? Hey, to yeah. Easter own man. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Nope. It's all Get, love and peace here, bro. 100%. Getting back to Jim and Eddie talking shit with the shitheads. You were an instant star and you brought up another blast from the past name that was all, I forgot about who was a complete legend, Rick Shapiro. Um, but yeah, you, you, you came on and you became instantly like a fan favorite guy on that yeah. show. Yeah, it was great. It was fun. It was really so how great. did you, how did you know Eddie and how do you like, cause it seemed like you were closer with Eddie coming into yeah. that situation. Yeah. Oh, I had no idea who Jim was. Um, I mean, I just knew he was his roommate. And as a matter of fact, I remember the first time I met Jim, he was like, I'm a stand up comic. And I didn't know he did Opie and Anthony. And I didn't know. Yeah. I mean, at the time, he wasn't the Jim Jeffries that with legit and everything else. And he actually gave he was like, you don't know who I am. He gave me like DVDs of his Comedy Central special. And I was like, oh, yeah, I'll watch this. Um, but um, so I met Eddie in the same time that I was doing Truth or Dare. When okay. I was sort of going to comedy clubs, like I, you know, I've performed on comedy club stages, but I'm not a comedian it, really in the truest sense of the word, because I don't like, you know, comedians. And again, it, if it's, it's either crowd work, which is that, or 
it's material that you work Act. on and yeah. the nuance of the words and like which i it's a complete art form and i completely respect it but it's just a different thing it's not like you know and even comedians will say like they get sick of their material after a while but it's like it's a it's basically a one person show that you perform you know in front of the right. audience the same bits and everything else and it's its own thing so i met eddie i actually remember exactly how i met eddie it was at um stand up new york which is on the upper west side and i happened to be at stand up new york and i was actually with kurt because at this point kurt and i became uh friends let's say we both like to go skiing <laughs> yeah. they get it hey yeah, yeah, yeah. i get it i get it so Look I, at was that. At, hey. I was at the service bar and yeah. i was like joking around with with some people like the waitresses and things. Cause I knew people and Eddie was there and Eddie, you know, one thing I will say, I mean, I look, I, lo I really do love Eddie. And he's one of my like very, very good friends. And like right. Eddie is not insecure. And the reason why I'm friends with a lot of comics or the comics that I want to be friends with is because like, I don't think I'm threatening because I'm not, I don't have that same career trajectory. You know what I mean? So it's right. like, so when I met Eddie, Eddie was like, Hey, you're really funny. I mean, you know, or something like that. And he was like, do you, you know, are you a comic? And I was like, no. And then we just became very friendly. And then he moved to LA almost immediately after that. And then I started going to LA for, this is before I moved there for four years. And I started going to LA for, for various, you know, like I had a, a, I had a deal with Spike TV and I would go out there for, you know, periodically for, for castings and, and meetings and that kind of bullshit or whatever. And um, every time I would go out there, I would always call Eddie just to check in. And he had this crazy stripper girlfriend at the time. And, you know, so that was it. So we met in New York at Stand Up New York. And then I would come to L.A. and then he would always you know, if I was in LA and I had a, a day or two, or I, may, I maybe stay. I, I always stayed at the the Hilton in Beverly Hills, which is right. You know, it's so it was anyway. So that's how I know Eddie. I know him yeah. from like New York, and then just I would come to LA, 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 and then for a while his sister lived in town. So when he would come through, and we would just you know, but he was always living in uh, LA, and I would live in New York. And then when I lived in LA and he was in Venice, that's when I started doing talking shit, and then he met right. his wife. And then blah 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 blah. You know, so that's that's the answer to the question you asked me an hour ago. That's how I know. Yeah. <laughs> well, that 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 show was like basically Legion of Skanks before Legion of Skanks, where they yeah. all just party. They had a weird cast of characters watching yes. live and taking part. Um, right. Right. And one of my favorite guys out of that show, which I'm still curious what happened to him to this day, was uh, Jason Hour. Yeah. Yeah. You you, yeah. you stay in touch with that guy, or you know anything about what his whereabouts? No. I actually, okay, so, I mean, let's just, we'll just do it, right? Fuck, who cares? But, like, so I actually had, like, a problem with Jason um, because, all right, so Jason, as I understood him, this is the, the very beginning of, God, we're talking about ancient history here, but, like, the very beginning of talking shit, it was, like, Eddie and Jim, and then, you know, I would come on and do third mic, and then Jason was just kind of, he was, like, for lack of a better term, he was sort of like a whack pack, right? He was yeah, punching a punching bag. bag. Yeah. And, <laughs> and, yeah. And then he, I remember he lived in a house that didn't have a door. Do you remember that? That was yep. like a thing. Yeah, right. of course. And he worked at a coffee shop, right? So yep. he was sort of Edgy. this, yeah, he was, he was like this local Venice guy. And because I didn't live in Venice, I lived really far away. So, and I yeah. wasn't in the mix with all these guys. I would just kind of come down, do the show, hi, hi, and leave. So I didn't know. Jason, I mean, I knew the relationship there, but then there was a, about brr, eight years ago, I guess, we did a live talking shit at the um, Paris, at the Paris uh, Comedy Club in uh, Las Vegas. And I had heard from Eddie that Jason had done something like he had, it was something along the lines of, like threaten somebody or he kind of like, he went from sort of this gentle giant guy. to there was some sort of a violent episode and I don't really remember the specifics of it, but apparently Eddie worked through, Eddie worked through it. Like they worked through it, but it was something that I didn't like. I didn't like, I don't, I don't like that kind of stuff. Like then it's, then it's like, it's not fun. It's not fun. It's not funny. So like, I, I thought that like, it was, 
I would say to Eddie, like, why do you have this guy around if he's like kind of a liability? Like it was something, whatever the situation was, it was enough where I was kind of like, I don't want to do the show if that guy's going to be around. That was kind of my position. Um, and so we went to Vegas and I went from New York and it was great because I, I mean, we all made good money. I, I probably made the least amount, but it was really good money. And I went from New York to Vegas. We all stayed at the Paris Casino and we we did the show and then Jason was there and I I ended up like telling the story again because Jim like pitched it to me and I was on stage and we did it. It's actually really funny. It's a sidebar. I remember after the show, I was standing at a light and we were going to this after party at the Intercontinental, which is not too far from there. And a guy comes up to me and uh, he goes, uh, I was just at that show. And I said, oh, that's terrific. And he goes, no, no, you're fucking disgusting. <laughs> I was like, oh, sorry. Okay. Can we hit the walk? Walk. Don't walk. You know, like. Right, so, right. Um, but that, and then that night we went out to, we were, we were at the after party and then the after party turned into something else. And then we were at like a strip club at like eight in the morning and I had my credit card down and I got annoyed because Jason was drinking on my tab. Oh shit. So you guys never became like best bus throughout the night. There's no happy ending. He, he was just fucking you the whole I, entire night, man. No, no, no. It, it was, there were a lot of people around and he was just kind of, you know, one of like sneaking around, man, just like like it was fine. Like I don't know. Plus, like my ex girlfriend, who by that point her husband had picked her up and she had gotten completely crazy, so she was gone. Right, she's like, fucking gone. She's nuts. Yeah. yeah. But I had friends that were already in Vegas. There was like a big group of us, and I had just I had put a card down at this particular like table, and it was me and Jim and Eddie and um uh that sweet. I forget her name, but th- that girl. Cute I got girl. a quick question. I'm so sorry. Did you confront him though when he stole your shit? Well, he didn't steal my shit, but I said to him, he ordered a drink. Yes, he ordered a drink from the waitress. And I literally said to him, how are you paying for that? And he was kind of like, uh, and I was like, you better not be drinking on my tab. And he was like, uh, and then I, when well, the waitress came over and she either gave him the drink or didn't give the drink. And then I closed my tab and yeah. then I like walked away. I, just, I didn't let him, I just didn't, I didn't want him mooching off of me. Right. In that yeah. night or any other night. And I, maybe that's like a dick. Do you like, ever try to apologize or come up to you like, hey, man, I'm sorry I did that? Like, I think maybe, but I just didn't want to know about it. I just was kind of no. like, listen, you know how I feel because he knew how I felt. So in my mind, it was like, listen, if you know somebody either has a problem with you or doesn't want to be around you, don't, don't approach them. <laughs> don't come up and like kind of cage drinks off me. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> you know, he's got again, some balls, man. Uh, I know. Whatever. So, <laughs> But apparently, just, like, go ahead. Yeah. I was just saying, he's an interesting character. But, yeah, I could totally see him doing that. And it's kind of yeah. like, yeah. He's thirsty. You know, he's, he's married. He has a kid. I mean, I wish him the best. I haven't seen this guy right. in years. I don't know. I mean, I'm sure. Look, it, it was, it was a, we were all, and we were all, like, everyone was, you know, we were pretty blessed. Up, so yeah. it was fine. I mean, yeah, among other things. So, I mean, you know, I probably shouldn't have been so, like, aggressively, like, you're not drinking like that. I wasn't that bad. <laughs> <laughs> No, yeah. I got. I want to get. I want to ask you a, a real, actual, real, a, like a question that I really want to understand about. Because you were in the porn industry for a good moment, weren't you? Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, if my, if I'm correct, were you a director? You were behind the scenes. You were behind the scenes, obviously, correct? No, I'm. Uh, I'm Peter North. In case you can't tell, I've. I'm using, <laughs> yeah. No. All right. So I will tell you. I will try to make this succinct, but I will yeah, give yeah. sort of trajectory of this. So, I. Worked for a company, and by the way, people that hear this sometimes they go, "Oh, you're full of shit" or whatever. I'm like, it's all very easy to find on Google or YouTube or whatever. I worked for a company called Women's. Actually, we'll take it one step further. Okay, I had a deal with Spike TV because I used to be on those shows on VH1, like I Love the '80s, and yeah. uh, you know those those kind of clip shows you would do for VH1. I honestly don't even know which ones I was ever on because you would sit in front of a green screen at this studio off of Eighth Avenue, and they would just fire questions at you. And some people, like other people, like Christian Finnegan would be on these and Sherrod would be on these. Some people would like write jokes. I would never write stuff. They would say off camera, what do you think of Billy Joel? And I would just go, boo, 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 you know, whatever, too short. And he's good. Now he's yeah. bald. He married, he's a married child, whatever. And like that kind of stuff. So then all they would do is they would take those clips. They would sit you there for like two hours and they would take these clips and they would just kind of put them into different shows. You know, I love the 80s. Uh, rock stars, hot wives, or whatever. They were like clip right. shows. They were very popular in the early 2000s. So I did this show, 
and then the 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 production company that did these they were they were not in-house vh1 production they were hired by vh1 so this guy comes up to me and he goes listen i work for spike tv and i i like what you're up to and that this is the same time that i was doing truth or dare down at the bowery poetry club and he goes if you have any ideas for a show um you know where i i'd like to you know so i was like i was like i actually do have an idea where the idea would be um where you would take if you gave somebody a hundred dollars how can you squeeze the most fun out of that hundred dollars if you're going to go do something i said you'd call it brian mccarthy's guide to budget living it was sort of like a like a travelogue but like a way to kind of like you know if yeah how to live on a budget how to party on a budget if you want to get if you want to get fucked up on a thursday night and you don't have a lot of money look for art gallery openings because they're always going to have wine mm -hmm. and just look for yes. those and, and like you can you can get a good base coat by going right. out that kind of thing so all right and he was like it's a great idea what's your first idea and i said well why don't we do one i'm literally i'm just pulling this out of my ass right and i go yeah. why don't we do one where i go to a strip club and i go to a strip club and we sort of figure out like you know how do you navigate like you don't you spend how do you have the most amount of fun for the least amount of money in a strip club he goes oh it's a great idea he goes do you know any places i go yeah of course i do i always i always say to people like if people ask you if you can do something just say of yes of course yeah yeah. <laughs> yeah yeah so right. he goes so he goes uh yeah and i said yeah i do and he goes well who and i said well i have a couple give me a day or so because i right you gotta think about your bullshit you were just talking about <laughs> right i'm just i just threw a little i just get a little tread water right so <laughs> right. I, the Hustler Club here in New York, <clears throat> over 11th Avenue, and I get some guy, director of marketing, on the on the on the phone, and I yeah. tell him Spike TV is going to come in, and I I kind of fudge it a little bit because it's not really Spike TV, but we're going to pitch this to Spike TV, and I had sort of a paper deal where Spike TV would do a first look at ideas, so we show up, I've got this camera crew. And we show up like a week later and we have a girl there and we have a host and we do the thing. And the director of marketing was this guy named Steve Carroll, K-A-R-E-L. You can Google him if you want. And he's like bald guy with a ponytail. Um, he looks like um, Paul Heyman, if you know that, from uh, ECW Wrestling, if that rings a bell with anybody. But And he's got a suit on. He's a little – he looks like the it's the Fantastic Four, like the thing, you know? He's just like – and he's got a pinky yeah. ring. <laughs> yeah. And, He's like, it looks like terrifying, kind of. I mean, he ended, he ended up being a pussycat. So I do this whole thing where I'm shirtless, surprised, and there's strippers there, and I'm running around, and we're, we shoot this thing. It's an afternoon, and afterwards, this guy Steve comes up, and he goes, hey, you're pretty good with the broad. He goes, you know, I own a women's wrestling uh, company down in Philadelphia. How about I pay you $500 to come down? You'd be funny with the girls. I'll give you a camera. You run and talk bullshit. I'll give you a hotel room for the night. I was like, yeah, that sounds like fun. And by the way, I know nothing about wrestling. I didn't grow up liking it. I don't know. I mean, we all know Hulk right. Hogan, whatever, but I've never been a fan. I'm not a mark. I don't know anything about any of it. Matter of fact, if you had to ask me, I think it's all really fucking stupid, but I can appreciate that people have, you know, for it. you know what I mean? Storylines. Okay, fine. To me, it's all, you know, it's not my thing. So but yeah. whatever. So anyway, point is, so I get on to Philadelphia and I don't even know what I'm going to do. Like, I have no idea. So I show up. And they have like a production truck. There's people running around and it's, it's called women's extreme wrestling. And it's like girls wrestling. And the guys that used to own something called ECW, they yeah. had started W E W and it was only on pay-per-view television. So I show up the first I'm show up there and I have a camera and I have a mic and I have a couple lavaliers. And so I'm just producing bits. I go up to a, like GI Ho would be one of the wrestlers. And I go, mm. Hey, GI Ho, um, listen, I said, we're going to go tap to three down. I'm just going to say some silly things to you and you react however you want. I go, GI Ho, I, I heard you got your nipples blown off in Iraq. What do you think about that? Ah, you know, bullshit, you know, whatever. And at yeah. the end of the night, I go to Steve Carroll and he's like, Oh, you got a tape. I'm like, yeah, I shot five hours. He was like, you have five hours? And I'm like, I don't know. I was here for five, you 100 bucks an hour, you know? So give him the tape. <laughs> yeah. the here you go. And I'll, I'll be at the Comfort Inn if you need me. I milked and it. <laughs> I'm there, you know? And so what else am I going to do? It's better to right. work than not, you know? Right, and exactly. Only, and, but it was at, like, this place called the Electric Factory. And there were, like, 2,000 people in the audience. It was, like, a ring. It was, like, a big – it was a, for whatever it was, it was something, you know? So a couple days later, I get a call from Steve. Flash forward six months later, I'm now like basically I'm writing storylines. I am executive producing all my own bits and I'm like the funny, goofy. I'm effectively like the announcer, on camera announcer for women's extreme wrestling, right? And I do this for the next year and a half. 
two years and I'm only getting paid. I actually started getting paid more money because I was like, look, you guys, I'm writing their website. I'm coming up with characters. I'm kind of involving myself in storylines. We were traveling to um, Atlanta. We did most of them in Philadelphia, but we did Atlanta, Miami, New York. Uh, I'm sorry, not New York, um, Philadelphia. So I became like just sort of by accident, this integral part of this women's extreme wrestling thing, right? And there were owners of it and, and then three owners. And I worked for the, they were my three bosses and all, everyone else was like, was sort of like freelance, but I was like an employee of these people. So, and Steve was, I was like his New York guy and I had a lot of authority. I could kind of do whatever I wanted. And yeah. so I started learning about, cause I, I started learning about sort of the, the mechanics of like production and, you know, just not even necessarily lighting, but just sort of watching how pay-per-view was. And I had this idea because they were only on pay-per-view television six months out of the year. So right. I had an idea that was their, their contract. And pay-per-view they were successful on pay-per-view they were typically to get into it like every time you pay-per-view you would click on it it would be 25 dollars that you would pay and they would get like i don't know six dollars right so if you could budget it where in one night you could spend 35 40 thousand dollars and in that one night you could generate three independent pay-per-views out of that one night of production now you're looking at if you can break 40 thousand they're called plays 40,000 plays per per pay-per-view event that you got out of that one night, you know, it's money. You know what I mean? And you're doing yeah. that six times a year. So it was an ongoing financial concern for these guys, but they could only get on six months out of the year. So at this point, I've been doing it for a while. I was very comfortable with everybody. And I said, you guys, I want to have a meeting and I have an idea where we can use effectively same crew you, the ring was coming out of North Carolina. We were working with uh, some guys from ECW. We're doing a little bit of men stuff, but not really because those guys, there's a guy, New Jack and Sandman. And yeah, that's a whole other thing. Yeah. That's a whole other thing. And we did those guys in Atlanta and they were a New Jack guy. I remember we were in a hotel room one night and is after the show and he's walking around with just like a sack of cocaine. Like I might have had to be <laughs> and he's well, He famously show. stabbed a guy, right? In the ring. I believe he did something like that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. My theory about male wrestlers is they have a tremendous chip on their shoulder because they know everyone thinks that what they do is fake and they are really, really, they have no sense of humor about themselves. And I kind of learned that the hard way, but nothing really happened. But I remember I was kind of like party with this new Jack guy and this girl, shout out to Bobcat. She said to me, listen, don't, like don't because I don't I don't know these people I don't I don't know ECW I don't know about the chairs and the heads on sticks and shit they said she said look stay away from him he's bad news but and then I found out later how crazy he really was just by just you know anecdotally I never saw him do anything but anyway right. except for all the coke so anyway so I said to these guys we called a meeting Steve's apartment right here 88th Street and um the two other guys one guy came up from Philadelphia another guy came down from fucking Catskills where he lived in a, in his compound, this ex Vietnam vet, crazy guy. And they sit there and I had prepared and I said, here's what I want to do. I want to do a series. Okay. But I don't want to make it like as serious as wrestling because wrestling is all about finishing moves. I said, right. I don't want to, I don't want to have like actual athletes involved, but I want to use the wrestling girls we use and I want to use them as talent. I had this idea to do a series about women in prison that wrestle each other. Okay. And you're going to have an evil warden called the warden beef curtains. And she's going to have four correctional officers, C hose, nipple slip, tickle pink, booty call and camel toe. And this nefarious evil warden is going to force nubile young inmates. And we'll use, because when we shot in Philadelphia, we would always go to like trip clubs in the area and we would find girls to be like nurses or flight attendants or whatever the storyline was. We pay them like 200 bucks and it would just be some girl that we got from like, um, cheerleaders or Delilah's or whatever. And she'd right. come in and she'd be like, she wasn't a wrestler and she wouldn't be in the ring, but she'd be one of the girls that we would hire to, you know, to be like eye candy. Right. So I said, we're going to use those eye candy girls. We're going to pay them a little bit more, just a little bit more because famously the, the rule was you could get these girls to do anything once. Because after that one time, they'd want more money. They'd become a pain in the ass. Some shit, a boyfriend would show up or something. So I said, we'll pay them a little more money, but they're going to actually wrestle each other. But they're going to wrestle in either heated oil, whipped cream, blueberry pie filling, which I hate to say because it's very expensive, chocolate sauce, <laughs> beer. Um, we had two Asian girls wrestle once in duck sauce. That was good. There you go, dog. Yeah, so I said, 
that's what we'll do. I said, and it's the whole theme is going to be, we're going to have this warden. She's going to be really hot. She's going to be in like an SM prison outfit, you know, and we're going to have these sea hoes and we're going to use the wrestling girls. We're going to use them as the talent and they're going to apply the goop on the girls. The girls will come in in orange jumpsuits. They'll be, they'll be, you know, uh, handcuffed or whatever. And we're going to, we're going to call this thing the Shaw Skank Redemption. Okay. And Shaw they have, Skank, wait, what? Shaw, Shaw Skank, Skank Redemption. Skank. Which, by the way, you right. can go on YouTube and you search this Shaw Skank Redemption. Somebody put up 25 minutes of it, and it's like – it's gotten a lot of hits, but I don't see any of that money or anything. But it's, it, you can find it on YouTube. So the three of them looked at me like I was crazy. And I said, look, because I needed money. I said, look, I need about 20 grand because I need to incorporate. I needed – I knew what the ancillary costs were going to be to start this thing up. And the thing about pay-per-view television is it is consignment television. So basically I make it or you make it right. You bring it to them on pay-per-view and they just provide the technology and they show it and mm -hmm. they decide how much it's going to charge. They decide what time it's going to be on. Sometimes it's part of like a bundle, but that's something called VOD, which is different. So basically you incur all of the cost of producing this thing and then you go on and then it shows. So I had figured out in one night I could generate two pay-per-views just by virtue of my experience knowing how to maybe make two independent storylines with editing while you're doing this. And they're not really storylines. Girls come on, they wrestle covered in goop, and then they go out and they come and, you know, but you also have interstitials where the wrestlers were, the, the warden would run down, these fucking skanks are going to come out of here. Their pussies stink like fucking day old fish. And I don't give a fuck who knows it. <laughs> like that kind of shit. It was funny, you know, it was all, yeah. it was all very campy and stupid. So, right, but it's fun. Yeah. Fun. Fun for the kids. And so <laughs> exactly. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So I said, so I said, but I needed like about twenty thousand dollars. And so the three of them were like, one guy said, I'm not interested. The other guy said, and when I say 20, I had 10, I needed 10. The one guy, the third partner, who was a minority partner, he said, All right, I'll give you 10 grand. Uh, it ended up that he ended up borrowing the 10 grand from somebody that I had to pay back, but that's another story. But uh he said I'll give you the 10 grand. And then Steve Carroll, who was the guy that originally hired me from the Spike TV thing, Steve right, said, right. listen, I'm not going to give you any money. But if you put this thing together on your own, because he had the keys to pay-per-view, he had the relationship with pay-per-view television. Right, right, so right. I said, all right, listen, uh, he goes, you make this thing, it's all on you, but you bring it to me and I will act as the agent and I'll take 15% of this thing if it goes anywhere. So, okay, so we're on. So... I ended up ordering these orange jumpsuits from some factory second inmate company uniform place down in Alabama somewhere. My wife stenciled convict on the back of them. We sat in our apartment on 72nd Street. I go down to Philadelphia. We, my, my, my partner, this Dan Cowell, the, the other guy, he was a local Philly guy. He packed this place. It was the old ECW arena called the New Alhambra. He packed yeah. it out. We had a, this big crowd. I came out. I ran it down. We had a guy designed it so it looked like a prison thing. And I went to Jet Row, and I said to Jet Row, I was like, what do you guys have that are dented cans? Like, I want, like, dented, you know, like, what stuff do you have that you can't sell? And I gave all the guys that worked at Jet Row, like, free tickets to the show. I mean, they were kind of free anyway. But I gave them free tickets to the show, and right. I said, listen, and they gave me – so I just kind of looked at this big pile. Of, I said, all right, there's blueberry pie. Although later on I had a black <laughs> blueberry pie filling, which, again, was <laughs> – Yeah. Because you need – for this – for the gimmick to really work, the girls had to be covered in it, right? You right, right, right. Like a Smurf. Yeah, you can't just be like, you know, it can't be like a tablespoon. It's got to be, you know, rub it in and the girls put it in their tits and everything. Puts, you know, right. Like, you can see their oh. fucking camel toe. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah moose knuckle. Exactly right. The and then, knuckle, by the way, yeah. that was one of the girls was uh, we had camel toe was another character that I had because we did another series just like this. And that was called the Broads of Education. And that was called Ass Break Academy. And that actually was on pay-per-view. And instead of a warden, we had a principal. Her name was Principal Assets. Get it? Same yeah. kind of premise. So anyway, so I make this thing, edit it. We actually get up. we get three pay-per-views out of this one night of shooting, okay, which is kind of unheard of. I hand it, into, she hand it into Steve. Steve goes, he looks at it. You know, nobody even really looks at this stuff. He goes, I'll give it to the guy at pay-per-view. Pay-per-view goes, all right, we're going to give you 30 plays, okay? A play – is just a time slot. So 30 plays, one play could be seven o'clock on March 15th on Friday night, right? Or And that's that's your play. So the hope is if a thousand people order it, because it goes into 
millions of homes have this technology to order it. But there's only right. the next people that that even know about this, and there's a there's a very niche audience of people that watch pay per view. And this is before YouTube. This is before a Hello. lot of. So, oh yeah, but this is if you wanted to see like quirky, weird stuff like midget tossing or my stuff or whatever, you had to go on pay per view, or I guess you had to buy DVDs and pay right. or VHS stuff Your from some website. Right. So the 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 sort of the gold standard for the for the uh, was a thousand plays. So I said, okay, thirty times a thousand. That would be if we could get a thousand thirty times three hundred thousand. They're fifteen percent. They take X amount. I'll make about eighty grand for one of these things. So to me, I'm like, that's pretty good money, right? Okay, fine. So they show, it goes to 30 plays. And then Steve calls me after 30 plays and he goes, listen, he's like, they're going to give us more plays. And I said, how many more plays? And he goes, 250. And I was <laughs> like, holy shit, we're on to something here. So there you go. So it went on, it made, you know, it, it was very, very successful in its own right. weird world. So it did that, okay. Second one went, third one went. Then we did, uh, and then we got a deal to put them on like um, DVD. So if you were in like um, a Best Buy for five dollars, they were in truck stops for five dollars. And you know, again, look, are we talking like tens of millions of dollars? No, but you were talking significantly. You know, it was it was good. It was it was it was, it was a good a, start. Yeah, exactly right. So it did that. Then we did the principal assets thing, and then that third guy, the third partner who was up in the Catskills who I offered to give him a piece of this in the beginning, he pre essentially had a nervous breakdown. And he was like, if you continue to do this with the other partner, like, I'm going to kill myself. You guys can't do this anymore, blah, blah, blah. You just said, fuck you. You just went with it. We sort of did, but it became like, <laughs> Steve, like Steve and he were the older guys. And Steve was like, yeah. listen, Brian, like, we're doing well with this. But if we're going to move forward, we need to do some lawyer you need to commit suicide so we can just get on with it. Yeah, some kind of. <laughs> and then I was kind of at this point, I had moved to L.A. already and I was right. doing comedy stuff. And I was kind of like, you know what? I could see that it was diminishing anyway because pay-per-view was really on the way out. I jumped in right. on this. This was like owning a horse and buggy in 1914. Like I knew right. that this was going – I could see the writing on the wall. So then I'm in L.A. Okay, I believe, I'm almost – I don't know. This is a lot. I'm sorry. But I'm in L.A. I had a, na a manager from a company – this company called uh, Rebel Entertainment. I was working with a guy named Paul Dinan for Consumption Junction. He had a show, and we were approached – and we were, the, I was known to be someone who had had this weird success in pay-per-view television, right? Right, so right, right. I get a call from Rebel and Rebel says, listen, we have a client. Her name is Tara Patrick. I knew who Tara Patrick was. And they go, her husband, Evan Seinfeld, who I remember from Oz and he was the lead singer or guitarist for Biohazard. She goes, yeah. Her husband wants to get involved in pay-per-view and we know that you've had success with that. And, for, and also I had keys to the castle because at this point i had my own relationships of pay-per-view that i could go to and i figured if it wasn't wrestling i could not deal with steve on this one i could kind of branch out on my own which i was right and wrong about and they said that he wants to evan wants to have a phone call and he wants to get because tara at the time tara never liked doing porn and tara did not want to be involved in adult anymore so that was what that was so i said okay uh let's set up a phone call so we get on the phone and Evan's there. It's a conference call and it's just Evan, me, and, this, and the agent. And Evan's like, well, what are your, what's the idea that you have? And I said, well, you said Tara doesn't want to be involved. And again, I'm spitballing here. And uh, I said, how about we do something where we have – and then I forgot. E Evan says to me, he goes, I want to have midgets in it. And I said, Evan, they're little people, please. Um, come on, can we not? No, I said, I'm like, what do you mean? You want them to be having sex? Like, what do you want them? He goes, no, I just want a minute. You know, because at the time we were talking about – want a like, minute? <laughs> He wanted a minute. He wanted a minute. He, he, time we were talking about like comedy or porn. He didn't know what he wanted, but he, he was he wanted little people. So I said, okay, why don't we do this? Why don't we have Tara Patrick, okay? Because she didn't even want to be in it, but we wanted to use her name to sell it on pay per view. I said, so why don't we have Tara? The premise is she's home. She gets a phone call from uh from Hugh Hefner. And Hugh Hefner says, Tara, I need you to come to Chicago for this big event, and you're gonna leave. And yeah, I need you to come for a weekend and now you owe me a favor. So Tara is sitting in a hot tub. She hangs the phone up. Camera pulls back. We're going to have two little guys wearing adult diapers and like rattlers and little bibs and stuff. And they're going to be fanning her with big fans, like little uni unix, unix. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. He's going <laughs> to gonna say, okay, you know, big and strong. Listen, you guys, I have to go out of town. So when I'm out of town, you watch my house. 
and I don't want any parties, okay? And they both look at each other. Oh, <laughs> they oh. And then we smash <laughs> To all these sexy, crazy things where the girls are running through yards and they're they got water balloons and you know all the stuff that we end up right. shooting. Later. And I said we're going to call these little guys. We're going to call them oil babies, okay? And they're going to run around yeah. with spray bottles full of oil, and we're going to have only girls there, and it's going to be crazy, and it's gonna be, and we're going to shoot the whole thing so we can make it like a pool party that Tara's not even at. And the whole premise is is that when she's out of town, you know, when the mice, when the cats away, the mice, the mice, <laughs> yeah. And uh, and the guy like Evan's on the phone. Evan goes, "Yeah, that's awesome. Let's do that." So <laughs> I'm like, "All right." So I I, I said, "Okay, working out the details." So um, I mean, just talk numbers. I, I got paid like fifteen grand to produce and direct it, but it was only it was only one day of work, so that was fine. Right. And I got paid. And by the way, spoiler alert: I never end up seeing this money, but I I was going to get twenty percent of the gross from pay per view television. Oh shit, so, that's a lot, man. That's actually pretty. I mean, it was something. But it was, it was a lot, ended up being a lot of nothing. But so anyway, so we decide we're going to shoot this thing in a month. And in, in that month, my wife and I and our 10-month-old daughter, we moved to L.A. And we're in L.A. And I call like the day before the shoot. And they go, okay, be at this address in Northridge, which is out in the valley, way out where the, there's bigger plots of land. Because, by right. the way, one thing you may not know about, it, the reason why you see a lot of porn outside is because people rent homes, but they don't rent. They they're usually the homes that they rent, they're not allowed to shoot. They can shoot in the kitchen or on the stairs, or they, that's why you see a lot of that kind of stuff. You never really see it in bed. There's a lot of shit like written in the agreement, I'm guessing, or something like that. The owner's like, hey, don't fuck on the countertops, please. Well, or fuck on the countertops, but not in my <laughs> Because you can, you can, a little 409, you can get that menstrual blood right off. Please of get some yeah. grime on the countertops for me. I appreciate yeah, it. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Because we always call on Thursday. Sleep it for me. Yeah, you're fine. Listen, guys, listen, you know, it's, it smells like cat food in here, but what are you going to do? So, right. so we, so I pick up Evan, we go out to the thing and I still don't even really know what we're shooting. I'm like, <laughs> I'm, I'm, like, I know there's going to be oil babies. I know the Tara's not even in this thing <laughs> there, but I'm sure there's 14 girls there, right? Yeah, that's we're, all, at, yeah. we're at this house and the house actually has like a grotto in the backyard and it oh. has like a slide. It was crazy. This house and this gay guy owned it. And it was funny because we actually were allowed to shoot in common areas in the house. And the guy had, it was kind of like that movie Birdcage. The guy had like phalluses and like, like dick paintings and things everywhere. I said to the guy, the owner who's there, which is awkward. I said, do me a favor. Can you like ungay the house, please? And just go ungay the house. Like get like the dicks and the, the, the you know. The, was he offended the, by that? The, no, he was fine. Yeah, okay. per, the Priscilla, queen of the desert poster. Can you put all that stuff and just put it in your bedroom? He was like, yeah, I get it. No problem. So anyway, so we're there. And then while we're there, they had hired Ron Jeremy to play the cop to break up the party. No shit. Yeah. So how like, was that? Did you meet him? Like, how was that meeting? You know, like directed him. Yeah. Like how I was I, that. Was I had album park his Honda Accord. It was fine. I mean, he was. I mean, to be honest, the first time he shows up, he shows up and he has his cop outfit on because we yeah. told him he shows up and he parks his Honda Accord, cloth seats, and. Um, <laughs> And he parks his Honda Accord and he's got his wheelie bag and he comes over and he goes, I said, hey, Ron, nice to meet you. Here's your outfit. I said, do me a favor. We only have one of these. So the idea is at the very end of it, he was going to get pushed in the pool by all the girls. I said, do me a favor. We got one take for this. So please don't get this thing wet. Don't eat in it. Don't get any ketchup because we order blimpies because, you know, craft services. I said, just so this is your but we got we have we have one shot. You know, what I mean? it's like Tropic Thunder, one explosion. Right. So. Right. So he he's like, okay, fine, kid, I got it. So we shoot, and at the very end of the thing, there's this hot tub uh, orgy scene, right? All the girls are, are are doing their thing. The oil babies are have already been um, they've already been cut. They're 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 wrapped. They're already let gone. And um, and then I'm there. And Ron Jeremy, the idea was he comes in, and his idea is to come in, hit the mark, and go. All of you people, you girls know that this is Tara Patrick's house. This is not a place to have a big crazy party. You know, we're getting getting complaints from all the neighbors. And while he's talking, the girls reach up, they grab him by his shirt, and they pull him in the pool. He goes under, he comes out of the hot tub water, and all the girls crowd around him. And he goes, If you like this, get ready for another Tara Patrick. It's like the end of the thing, right? That's the right. our big the payoff of this stupid thing is that Ron Jeremy is the cop, right? So right. Ron comes in. There's an X on the rock, right? Ron comes in. I said, Ron, come in. Here's your mark, okay? And just this is your camera. All it's all lit, like very. We're we're lit for the end of this thing. All the girls have already been dead, 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 all that stuff. So Ron comes in and he decides that he's going to do 
an Irish accent. So he comes in and he goes, oh, saints be praised. Look at it's a Bagana Bagara. Ah, oh, you know, this is Tara Patrick's home. You can't be. And I said, cut, 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 cut. I said, <laughs> You're like, what the fuck? Like, what are we doing? <laughs> and he goes, I thought it'd be fun to do an Irish accent. And I'm like, I said, You're like, Ron, don't think, just do, all right? I said, Ron, I love that decision. And I love your energy. I said, but do me a favor. You've got such a... Uh, uh, I, 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 such a colorful New York voice, and everyone knows just how you sound. And I know you're you're a trained actor, and it's kind of like, yeah. I said, so do me a favor, just come in here and just hit it sideways. Right. You know what I mean? And just do it, do your thing. So he's kind of like, all right, kid. So he comes in and he does it, and that was it. So he does he it. Pissed. So then, so that ends up in the interim. By the way, we're down to one guy. Did the guy leave or something? No, he has something going on. He'll come back. He'll come back. Okay, whatever good. it is. Okay, fair enough. So, so we go. And so now that thing is done in the editing. I'm not editing it in the editing it while they're, while they're editing it, Tara and Evan get divorced. Okay. And it's an ugly divorce and they hate each other and blah, blah, blah. So I had done interviews with AVN. I had done interviews with some other kind of publications for adult, whatever it is. And, but this thing came out, no promotion from Tara and pay-per-view Ron didn't want to, Please. And I mean, he paid him six hundred dollars for the day. I mean, he's you know he's a, yeah, he doesn't give a fuck. He's like he's whatever. a valuable part of our show, but you know he wasn't he wasn't he didn't have any uh, any any anything in it past being paid for the day. So right. so that was that. So so it kind of lands with a deafening thud. So I never get the twenty percent. That's fine. But then Rebel, okay, they start getting phone calls from other people that want to get, get involved in pay per view. Hell, hey, he's back and. <laughs> Hey, look at that guy. And the idea was, is now we were going to start doing like, uh, I was doing some consulting and I had like a rate where I would meet you for lunch and it would be a couple of grand. And then people would say, Oh, I want to do like, um, women's uh, pillow fighting or, or something or whatever girls right. track racing. And for some reason that became like my niche and I would have a meeting with these people and I would go, I don't think this is a good idea. Frankly, I would say, and I would say, listen, pay-per-view it's either because at this point I'd figured out if it's pay-per-view, what you want to do is you want to shoot what you want to shoot essentially like wacky adult girl stuff or girl guy stuff, but that wasn't my purview. Um, and you know, the difference between like pay-per-view, although now it's all triple X, but back then right. review adult content was like this and I'm doing legs here. Right. And then yeah. pay-per-view for, I'm sorry. And then, you know, stuff that you would see on a DVD or whatever, you would just say, okay, I need five minutes of wide. And that meant take your legs and really open them. Okay. And that was, and that, and that we would come in and then you would see, you know, you'd see the hamburger, you know what I mean? So, so that was what that was. And so, so when you shoot pay-per-view television at, at this stage in pay-per-view, you're shooting the pay-per-view content but at the same time, you're doing like, for lack of a better term, a director's cut. And that adult stuff would go on DVD or it would go on television in U Europe or whatever it was. It would get distributed. So two different – basically you would do like, a, you know, an NC-17 version and a X version. And that would go somewhere and the X version would go somewhere. So I started like – and I figured out – I knew the budget. So I was like, look, why – and I had a partner, this guy named Mitch Stein that I work with. Great guy. I still talk to him all the time. Right. Um, gay as hell. Great. <laughs> Apparently just a fucking beast. And um, <laughs> oh, yeah. You know, I mean, yeah, trust me. I, I, that, I mean, I've never seen the thing, but I've just heard like, I mean, it's a real log yeah, splitter. It, you don't have to explain yourself to me, Brian. You're good, bro. Ass splitter. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, uh, right. Just leathery. Just one of those. So like, hey, so, man, le leather oh, sometimes yeah. is very soft. You know, depends well, on how you're it's right. Or, you know, the term we use is pliant. Okay. Pliant. <laughs> I'm sorry, baby. Quite all right. right let's not fight. Hey, let's fight. not. Let's not. Let's not fight right now. Give me, maybe give me 15. Too. I'm good, but you can't. Okay. I love you, honey. Thank you. Way over there, please. Thank you, baby. So, um, anyway, right. I have 15, maybe 10, 10, 15 more if you want. So, anyway, so Let's we go. 15, yeah. Okay, cool. So, anyway, so so I started producing this a content for pay per view, but it was only girl girl stuff, and I would just produce it, and it would go, and I would I'd spend say 30 grand, it would make 60, 70 grand. But the thing, the way that it worked, and then we can and this whole lineup, whatever this is, but we can like pay-per-view. If you think of it kind of like, like a Pachenko machine, you start off at in-demand pay-per-view and that is the biggest audience. And then it goes down to something called VOD. Then it goes to another company called RCN. And then, so if you have the right distributor, it just kind of keeps sort of re uh, monetizing 
through these sort of uh, cycles of distribution. So you may make something, and again, it's all about the budget. And if you make something that say costs $20,000, then you will take that one thing. And at the end of say a nine month uh, monetization uh, cycle or, or, or term, you may turn that into, you know, ninety, hundred thousand dollars $100,000. So if right. you've got 10, if you have five or six of these things running at the same time, then it's real money. Do you want to hear the thing that got me my last thing? Yes. Last and then I got, I got another question for you, but yeah, okay. let me this first. Well, but I think this is, I, I've told this before, but not that many times. So we decided that, and again, this pay-per-view was, was at the end of the thing, right? Now yeah. it, they had already, this is, this broadband was already people's homes. People were already having like Pornhub or whatever it was. Only and, fans. Yeah, yeah. No, not only. Fans, oh, not okay. Yeah, you're right. Sorry. Way before. It's all right. right. This, yeah. Um, so the writing was on the wall. So what that means is people were ordering this less and less. So the money was getting less. So I said to um, my Mitch, I said, why don't we see the cheapest thing we can possibly make? So we decided, or I made up this series and it was called Solo Sweeties. And the idea was we would have girls, porn girls, because they have to drive. Let's say they live in Reseda and they have to go to Northridge and they're going to make say $800 for their shoot, right? So my idea was, why don't we see if on their drive from Reseda to Northridge, let's see if we can get them to stop at a, at a, at a shoot at a location and let's just book them for one hour and we'll pay them like 150 bucks because we worked with a company called OC modeling, Sandra McCarthy. They're still mm-hmm. around. And I would, and I, and because I had done a lot of work, cause I'm only through my, time in this industry i'm only ordering girls and i was always a really easy person because i would just say to oc modeling look just give me 12 or whoever i don't care i'm not picky you know what i mean like no you seem nice to me yeah yeah it's fine just give me me whoever i'm not gonna like bust your balls if you send me somebody who's clearly been up for meth for four days it's gonna be an issue but only one guy like that we just sent him home but he was a production guy but um but anyway so i said you know, in, so in in my mind, it's like, look, the girls are going to be driving right past where we're going to be shooting anyway, so they can stop off. And all we're going to do is, I said, all we're going to do is we're going to we're going to have one couch. This is before backroom casting couch, okay? One couch. We're going to have it very bare. The girl's going to come in. We're going to open up with the girl sitting there off camera. I'm going to say, tell me the hottest experience you've ever had, okay? And then after three minutes, I'm going to go like this. Okay, and then the girl's going to do what we they were called teases, give a slow tease, okay, blah, 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 and then get all the way down naked, and then you're going to masturbate to orgasm, okay? It's going to be like, that's what it's going to be, okay? Right. And we're going to try to do this in one take, and we're just going to get this done, and we get four of these. It's going to be 15 minutes, so you figure five-minute story, five-minute hot tease, five minutes of caressing, and then in that five minutes, they're going to, as we call it, take it home, okay? right, right. right. So I figured, like, so that's so my director was a guy named Barrett Blade, who, interestingly enough, is now married to Stormy Daniels. Is that oh that's shit? Nice. That's <laughs> wild, right? That's nice, right there. Yeah. Anyway. So, so, so Barrett was my director. We shot it, Barrett, uh, at, at, at Barrett's home. So I would pay uh, Barrett, I think, five hundred bucks. We would do one hundred fifty per girl. So now we're at one fifty three, four fifty six. We're at eleven hundred dollars. Okay, and then it would you know figure. So it was about and then two fifty to edit this thing. So I'm making an a, a basically an hour worth of content that I would normally make for say twenty thousand dollars. I'm doing it for twelve fifty just to right. see how it would go. And guess what? It was making shitty money. But I'm making it for twelve fifty, so kind of who cares? You get this thing out there, and if it's going to make twenty five grand, you've spent twelve fifty. So you know. So, so anyway, so the last one we had to do. Now this is where it gets. This is the story part. So I called, and then uh, Sandra says to me, Brian, I have a girl coming over because for this kind of money, you're getting girls that are either brand new in the business, or you're getting girls that have been in the business for a long time, right? You know, you're not getting like Aza Kira, although Aza- season warriors. Or they're or they're neophytes, right? Although right. I did, Aza did work on a couple of my things when she, before she started doing Boy Girl, but uh, this is before she was like a big deal. But anyway, so we get this this, and she, but but Sandra says to me, Brian, we have a problem, or not a problem, but one of the girls we're going to send you is black, and the wa- the reason why that's an issue, okay, is why? because I'll show you, I'll tell you, because right. black girls, okay 
Typically, they have weaves or extensions. It's always their hair, okay? So if you have a, let's say you have a black girl on one of your shoots, you need to have somebody who's doing hair and makeup who can also deal with black hair because it's right, a, right, right. a different thing. That's all it is. It's, yeah, no, like, it's a totally different thing. Yeah, I don't yeah, understand. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And and frankly, and so, and now I don't even have anybody doing hair and makeup. So that's why Sandra would say she knew what the deal was. These people are on their way to getting hair and makeup. So if we were doing a, a, a there's one of these solo sweeties things and their hair got messed up. It would then begin. They should go in the bathroom. She'd start to mess around. And now you're burning daylight. Right? right. So I said to Sandra, I said, she goes, look, she's brand new. She's really sweet, but she's, but you're going to have to deal with her hair. I said, you know what? Let's just, cause it's a roll of the dice. I said, just have her come. It's fine. So girl shows up really quiet, really sweet. Um, very sort of petite, you know, not some like, you know, buxom, you know, uh, girl, but so she sits on the couch and I'm, I'm off camera and I said, okay, listen, here's the deal. Okay. I'm going to ask you the hottest thing you've ever done with a guy or alone or whatever it is, but do you have something maybe in your memory that you can think of? If not, I had like scenarios that I could kind of feed them. You know what I mean? Right. Right. Um, prompt right. a little bit. Yeah, yeah exactly. It's nine 11. You're getting raped by a dead firefighter. What? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. so uh so i go i go listen i said so i said but i can give you a thing you know we're, we're very easy I'm very right talented. right right i'm very yeah. talent friendly and also like i'm married i'm not to these girls i'm not like you know whatever i know they say harvey blinstein but whatever no no you're a sweet man i'm a sweet boy so <laughs> I'm, off, I'm off camera and i go okay we can do this and she goes oh, i think i can come up with something i can do it so she goes i go i go okay three two um, where is it time when um, I was with this guy? And I said, okay, cut. I said, number one, you're doing great, okay? I love what we're doing here. I love that work. <laughs> you're making us lean in, okay? But but I just need you because, and like just to give you the production idea of this, we're using the shotgun mic, which is on top of the camera. Oh, fuck, yeah, yeah. We don't have a boom. We don't have a lavalier. We're just right. we're using audio off the camera and the right. camera's on a tripod and it's be behind the light so you got to yeah, project about. a little bit yeah project even if you're not going to be whisper quiet you still have to project so i go let's try another one well i like it when this guy come up to me and he goes. i said okay how about i give you a, a story or something is that okay because i listen you're doing great but would that make you comfortable i can tell you to say something yeah okay she's just yeah, okay. I said, I said, why don't you talk about um, you're with your boyfriend and you're in his new car and you pull up to a, a lookout point and uh, you look out into and his hand comes over and you end up having sex in front of uh, a bunch of uh, wildlife and it's crazy because you're outside. Okay. Uh, okay. Three, two. So I was in a car and my boyfriend. Come. I said, all right, listen. I and all we've already been there now for like 40 minutes and the next girl is showing up in like 20 minutes which is going to jam it up right you don't right. want to have like you don't want to have a, you don't want to have the mall going on. you don't want to have the mall santa putting on the uh, white eyebrows while the other mall santa is waiting to put on the still warm suit you follow me <laughs> yeah i got you dog okay so i i say to her i said listen i said how about this how about you just talk dirty to the camera can you talk dirty to the camera? Can you just say some filthy stuff and just be nasty and just get it and just give me some real, just whatever you want to do. Just be right. real. She goes, talk dirty. I said, yeah. And I, she goes, okay. Now, by the way, I'm going to say a word here, which is, can be controversial. Can I say a word here? You can say what the fuck you want, doggy. Okay. So she yeah. goes, I said, I said, all right, so here's the deal. I need you just to sort of like, just be whatever you want to do. Just say whatever you like, and you're going to be blah, 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 blah. Just really get whatever you're going to do. But the most important thing is I want you to almost yell it. I want you to yell it, okay? Because you're being really quiet, which, again, is adorable, and that's a choice, and I respect that. But I need you to sort of throw it out. Throw it out to me. I'm going to catch it. I want to be like, throw it like a basketball because I'm a racist. So I said, you know, mm -hmm. listen, just have fun. You know, so I go, three, two, one. So she just... She goes, what's up, motherfuckers? Y'all want to see this nigga pussy? This nigga pussy is pink as a motherfucker. I said, okay, cut. I said, listen, <laughs> I love everything that you just did. And there was a right voice. It was the right volume. I said, but you can't say nigger pussy, okay? 
I right. just, you can't use an N word. That's just going to be an issue. I'm sorry. That's the world we live in. I wish it's your word. It's your choice. Some said based, man. That is pretty based. I mean, that's how there yeah. people talk to each other. Whatever know? it is. I mean, it was her choice. So she, I said, yeah. but three, two, one. She goes, I was some motherfucker you want. And she did it. And she was fine. Afterwards, right. we took a picture. I had the picture somewhere. And uh, and she left. But I, And then as she left, I said to uh, Barrett, I was like, you know what? I think like these things, this is becoming more of a headache. And then I, I had already started working for the National Lampoon at the time. And I was like, let me just stop doing this. So we made the last one. We sent right. it out. Made like $500 or whatever. And that was that. So there was it. So that was okay. my last shoot ever of adult content. So I, I, holy shit. So you actually just surprised me there. I didn't know you worked for National Lapoon. What were you doing for them by any chance? Okay. So I was back in New York. I had this, um, uh, I worked on a TV pilot for Spike TV that was executive produced by James Gandolfini. Right, right, uh, right. And Jim, Penny Droppers, you can find it on, I'm sure YouTube or something. But so I had this interstitial on this show. And when I was back in New York um, for the cast party that we had and a viewing party at this place on 14th Street, I actually sat with uh, Jim and his wife, uh, Deborah. And you can catch the brilliant name. She's the widow. She's still around. And uh, I sat with them. He was a really nice guy. I'm not trying to name drop, but like, no, no, you're good, man. And he was also like, he was really generous with me, and he actually said that I was the funniest guy that he'd ever met, which I thought was nice. You know, I didn't have to say that. You know what I mean? Anyway, right. right. I'm, I'm here to go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah there you go, but yeah, yeah, yeah. Pat yourself yeah. on the back. You deserve it, Brian. You deserve now, it. All right. Now, when you pick me up at soccer, daddy. Um, <laughs> yeah, all right. This is not my mom. This is one of your girlfriends. Yeah. All right. I'll right, give you. Right. 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 I'll give you daddy. On your nigger pussy. <laughs> <laughs> no, you, no, you deserve it though, Brian. You are actually brilliant though. That's what I want to say about this. You are brilliant, bro. But continue your story about that. I'm just fucking around. So anyway, uh, one love. Okay. So anyway, so the um, so at this cast party after the cast, and I'm I'm in LA already, but I'm back in New York, and I'm and I meet a guy. Uh, afterwards, I meet my friend out, and she's like, I'm with this guy, Marty, and Marty is the executive producer for National Lampoon. Oh, and shit. Marty had known about some of the stuff, and he had listened to Talking Shit, and he was sort of aware of some of the things that I had been a part of. And um, he goes, would you ever want to, like, do some stuff with us? And I said, you know what you guys don't have? It, and this is, like, sort of in the infancy. Well, not infancy, but I said, you should do a video podcast. Because I knew if you drive down Sunset Boulevard, they have a big yellow National Lampoon sign. I said, and I knew the Lampoon was on fumes for a variety of reasons. And if anybody's interested in the real story about the rise and fall of the National Lampoon, about four years ago, five years ago, the uh, Vanity Fair did an article. And I know all the players in the article, and it's a great article that chronicles, like, from the beginning with Maddie Sims and, right. you know, Doug Kenny and Michael Donahue to the moribund, you know, nine tenth inning when I was involved with it before it just completely became nothing. So I said, why don't we use the Lampoon name? Because you can still get some people in the room and sitting here and I'll do like a video podcast and we'll do an interview show. We'll call it National Lampoon Interview Show with Brian McCarthy. And Marty was like, you know what? I'm going to be in LA for a month. I'm staying at the people that own the Lampoon. I'm staying at their house. Let's just do it. Let's do it. So yeah. we worked out a, a deal, you know, and we did, and we use it really quickly. This is kind of a funny thing. So no, you're good. the first episode we ever did, there was a TV show called Outsourced. And it was a NBC sitcom about a, um, uh, uh, a one of those call centers in India. And it was all about like an American guy, fish out of water, comes over there. And all the actors were Indian except for this one white guy. And it was called right. Outsource, right? And so we got one of the actors on Outsource, this guy to be our first guest on our first show. And was only thing I knew, pardon me? Was it the white guy? No, the Indian guy. Um, okay. It, it, funny enough, his name was Patel. Everyone in India's name is Patel. But, uh, <laughs> yeah, right. but and the Indian guy, and he, the only thing I knew about the guy, because I really always, whenever you, if you ever watch the podcast, the interview show, I never do any uh, like pre show. I mean, sometimes I know the person, but I just, it's not like I sit there with like a list of questions and go, so what did you have to get? What are you, UCB or Second City? I just feel like, I think it's fun to organically find a conversation, right? Right, so, right. It's better. Yeah, yeah, I understand. I think so because it just seems more. Fresh. It's just more fun, man. Yeah. Yeah, it's more fun for if ever people for watching kids. and doing, frankly. And it's fun to kind of make you work a little harder. So, but I did happen to see that this guy was the first 
gay East Indian or East Asian person ever on television. And he was the first one that was out. And it was kind of a big deal in the LGBTQ community, right? Okay. So, and then I also found out that Outsourced, we had found out a couple of days before, was getting canceled. It was a one season. So here we have the first gay Indian actor on a canceled show. What a gay. And uh, so he's going to show up. But I'm happy to have him there. He's going to come up and do the show. Okay, fine. So he shows up. And then we're sitting there and we're sitting there and he was a very, I don't know if you've heard the difference between like LA and New York comics and whatever that is, but like LA, yeah. ske LA sketch comics. Okay. Tend to be precious. If that makes sense. Like it he does. was yeah. very much like he was not, but like all of this right now, he would have left an hour ago. Right. Of course. Like, he He's a pussy. It, He's well, a soy. It He's was a just, soybean. It was just his, Look, it's just how we the guy was. Some people are like that, some people aren't, and that's fine. Some I mean, people got so. thicker skin, yeah, yeah. Exactly. No, one's maybe not better than the other. Who cares? No, but, of course not. It just yeah, depends yeah, yeah. on your take. I mean, yeah. Yeah. And, and, and anyway, so I'm sitting with this guy, right? And I just go, I go, listen, things on. We got camera here, and the owners of the Lampoon, their sons are there, the Dundix boys are there, and uh, and and we've got and they're there, they're there. And I go to the guy, I go, All right, well, listen, the show's been canceled, right? And he's like, Yeah. And I said, and you're gay, right? And he's like, yeah. <laughs> you know, and I go, let's just talk about gay stuff. Like, let's talk about gay. Like, your first time, is it weird? Like, do you have foreskin? Like, what's going on? Like, like <laughs> I don't know, like, you know, gay Indian. I don't know. What's that even about? Like, gay yeah. Indian? <laughs> what? What's a glory hole in New Delhi even smell like? You know what I mean? Like, I don't know. And so we're talking, and the guy's having, the guy's having fun. We take a picture afterwards. He leaves. That's it. And he was represented by CAA at the time, right? We get a call from CAA. Marty gets a call, right? Oh, shit, yeah. for the show. And Marty gets a call. Like, literally, the guy leaves, like, within a half an hour, right? He gets a call. And the CAA person, I just hear Marty go, yeah, yeah. No, Brian, yeah, Brian asked him that. Uh, yeah, yeah, Brian asked him that. Yeah. Oh, he's upset? And, okay, well... And so we ended up not being able to air it. I think at some point maybe we didn't air it. So Marty hangs up. So apparently the guy, Marty says to me, because Marty wasn't there for the whole thing. Marty goes, did you ask him if he's ever pissed in a guy's asshole? And uh, I, said, well, I said, probably because- Yo, I never even thought of that before, bro. That's I crazy. That's the ultimate compliment because it's very hard to urinate when you have an erection. So if you're sodomizing somebody, <laughs> you seen them, I don't know. It's clean, you know? So anyway, so that was our first. So that's how I worked for the Lampoon. So I worked for the Lampoon for a while. Then I moved right. back to New York. I'm still working for the Lampoon. But in the interim, the Lakin family, Dan owned the, they owned it and they had sold the Lampoon and it had fallen apart. So I was there at the very, very, very end. And then it went away. And then that's when the National Lampoon interview show morphed into the Brian McCarthy interview. Now, now I got a question for you though. During sure. that time period though, how did you fall into like MLC? How did you find Kevin Brennan or how did he find you? Or okay, that's easy. Tell I listening to I, you know, I'm a, I'm a big fan of uh, Opie and Anthony, and I'm a big fan of you know Howard and you know Morning that kind of radio. And I was listening once, and I was listening. This is when um, Anthony and Opie and Anthony had already broken up, and right. Opie was working with Jim, and they had Kevin on as a guest, and I was listening. And I had never heard of Kevin. I had met Neil a bunch of times, and I knew of Neil, and and of uh, you know, I, and I knew the three Mike special. And I was kind of like, but I was like, wow, he has an older brother, and he's one of ten. And I thought he was really funny, just how crazy he was. And so I listened to it. I listened to the second one, and then I call Eddie, and I talk all the time. And Eddie, I'm very comfortable asking Eddie for like favors, you know, like because he's very generous with you know, his, whoever, whoever he knows, you know, and, uh, and I've done things for him in whatever capacity I can. So I called Eddie and I said, do you know, Kevin Brennan? Are you like friendly with him? Cause Eddie's been around forever. Everybody knows Eddie. Yeah. Um, you know, sure. whether or not they talk to him every day or whatever it is, but everybody knows Eddie if for, you know, for better, or for worse. So I go, do you know Kevin? And he goes, yeah, I know him really well. I go, I would like to be a guest on his show. Do you think that you could make that happen for me? And he's like, yeah, I'll call him. And within 20 minutes, I get a phone call, and it's Kevin. And Kevin goes, I hear you're blind. And uh, <laughs> and I said, well, I'm like blind-ish. I'm like, you know, I'm like, uh, I'm like the skinniest girl at fat camp, really. And uh, I, think it's like, 
I just want to get off the phone. You know what I mean? I was like, look, I want to be a guest on your show. If that's okay. I'm sorry to Eddie's my friend and Eddie probably vouched for me. So if you want to be on, he goes, what are you doing tomorrow? And uh, I said, I could probably do the show. And he goes, all right, come up to the, um, the, uh, the, uh, the comic strip and uh or yeah comic strip it's right here by my house and um he goes we did be taped get there at four o'clock whatever it was and so i get there and i'm a guest on the show and from there i was a guest a guest and then within like two months he was paying me to be sidekick or co-host whatever you want to call it and i was doing that for a while and then i started hosting with him on uh the kumia the the compound media so we were doing burning bridges yeah burning bridges, that's right doing burning bridges and in mlc so for a time i was working with kevin like four days a week eight hours a week it's a lot of kevin and how I, was that you know what it was fine because number yeah. one i don't i have a very thick skin i don't care and I understand like the dynamics of what people like and what what I think and is it's funny. It's radio. It's radio. It's like wrestling. Who cares? It's fine. And it was fun. And he would have guests on. And sometimes I didn't like the guests. And sometimes I'd be drunk on the show. And there a lot of times he'd be drunk on the show. And we would just do like it, it was a silly. I enjoyed doing it. It was a silly, funny show. It was easy because it was right on. 35th street so i could take the train at the time i lived in brooklyn it was easy to get to i went in i was making what was i making 1200 bucks a show or something so it was like it was money you know right. and then i would do the burning bridges and then we would do live shows and it was a fun way for me to be involved because one of the problems that i have always had with like the comedy community in new york is like you know like people know me but like I don't get, I don't, for a variety of reasons, you know, I, I could sound really neurotic and about a lot of this, but like, you don't, yeah, go nobody, ahead, go ahead. nobody puts me over, you know what I mean? Because yeah. I don't do stand up. And like, do I know, like, when I was doing the Lampoon show, I would have Greg Stone, Mark Norman, um, Tell, I right? have all these people on my show, uh, right. on my show. And then the idea would be when they're doing their own shows, have there's, there was no reciprocity. With the shows and they're not obliged to do that for me but it, it was but if but if i'm not in the clubs every night if i'm not doing stand-up then i'm not really in that crew which by the way is fine with me but just in terms of like the things that i wanted to do and the audiences that i want to get to it's problematic so right i was happy to be involved with kevin because this is before kevin got and i hate this word but before he got as toxic as he is for people, you know what I mean? Like this is what, like we had Bill Burr on our show. We had, I don't know. You guys had, had Shane Gillis, right? Didn't you guys have Shane Gillis? Yeah. Oh yeah. I'm saying the show. Yeah. He big time me. And uh, Did yeah. He? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I didn't. And that's why I joke that I don't like Shane and it actually got back to Shane. By the way, I don't care. By the way, Shane Gillis shouldn't give a shit if I like him or not. Who cares? But like I, Shane was did our show. And then after the night of that show, I was wasted right and after that yeah. show we hosted it was aaron berg shane a couple other people and i hosted the comedy i was like the host of the show right and i kept forgetting shane's name and i would call him like dobie gillis or <laughs> I don't know. And, this, and this is why this is like you're, five, just, you're just fucking with them a little bit five years ago and that's what i'm saying like all of these guys and they're so thin-skinned and they pretend <sighs> totally. to be such tough guys and I'm a this and that. And it's like, no, you really aren't. You're as neurotic and insecure as anybody else. <laughs> it's a fucking act. And just relax. Like a fucking chihuahua. Calm down. It's just It's going to be fine. And now, so what was funny is whenever Shane's name would come up in circles with people, with Joe or whatever, or friends and whatever, I'd always just be like, yeah, fuck that guy. You know, who comes <laughs> yeah. on stage short sleeves? You're short sleeves. I'm like, he's, fuck, I don't get it. I don't get it. Congratulations to him. I don't get it. Well, I okay. Oh, I'm so sorry, right. sir. Good I'm always, okay. So then Joe came up to me like a year ago and he was like, Hey, he's like, I was talking to Shane. He's like, Shane keeps wanting to know, like, why do you have such a problem with him? Which I just thought was funny. <laughs> I'm like, you tell him, fuck him. That's what the problem I have with him. He's, really? Actually, he's actually serious about that? Yeah, yeah. Because yeah. wow. you want everyone to know the fuck? any comic will tell you they could be killing in an arena if there's one person not laughing. Yeah. That's the person you see. That's demented, so, man. Don't really focus on whoever. Yeah, the one person that doesn't like them, or right. the one comment that pisses them um, off. It'll spiral yeah. them off. So, like the fact that, like Shane Gillis, who's enjoying tremendous success right now, the right. fact that, like, I'm out there and I'm like, I don't give a shit. Who cares? To me, it's funny. Do I really have anything an ill will about Shane? Gillis? No, no give a shit. But it, now it's funny to me. So, anyway, what were you gonna say? Sorry. Oh, well, I'll ask you quick. Uh, what, what's your thoughts on uh, the Z-Man, Zumok? Oh, you Chad? met him through there, right? Yeah. Yeah, I don't like him. 
Uh, yeah. Because when four years ago, when I stopped working with Kevin, Chad went on uh, a show. I don't even say the guy's name of the guy's show. I mean, who cares? Ten, 10 people listen to it, but why should those right. 10 people, why should he hear his name? But um, he went on the show and he gave out my cell phone number on the show. Yeah. Which I guess was like it's just dirty pool. You just don't do that. And I was getting calls, and and the, the problem with the type of the type of, and I was doing it too in terms of being on the show. The problem with doing um, burning bridges and you know, Brian, continue. Like, I'm gonna rock a piss real quick. Sorry, bro. Go, I'll go. be right back. <laughs> okay, Boy, it's like doing the Carson show, isn't it? Um, but the problem with that type of content or that type of stuff is that the people that listen, they they want to get in on it too. They want to like have fun with it too, which is great. But like their fun is like, it's like they can 24 hours a day. And again, I don't, you can say whatever you want about me, but like if you, they, they, they'll try to the term dox you, or I was getting a lot of phone calls. I was getting hangups and you know, it was getting, it was just, and I was like, Chad, like you don't need to give my phone number up. So that's my feeling about Chad. And then and it was funny because Chad stayed in my apartment. Um, Years before this, when Eddie was like, Eddie, I was doing a podcast festival at the Improv on Melrose with Eddie and Jim. And then I met Chad and Chad was like, hey, I'm coming to New York and I have a, I have a guest room, which is un unusual in New York. And Chad was like, can I stay at your guest room for a couple of days? And I said, sure, I guess. Eddie would vouch for him. And this was before I knew that he was like a convicted felon. And he stayed in my apartment. The one thing that was funny is, and Chad will talk about this, is that Chad was staying in my apartment and one and at the, in the guest room, which is down this long hallway. And I got completely naked and I crawled into bed with Chad. <laughs> <laughs> no, you did going, not, bro. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I, I just started going, ass of cash. Nobody writes for free. <laughs> <laughs> he jumped out of bed like he found a tarantula in the bed. So, and then or <laughs> the a homophobe. Yeah. Yeah. I just kept rocking it. I was like, what? It was just weirder to you, Chad. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, he hates that shit. Yeah. He, he hates fags. Yeah. Well, let me just say that the lady doth protesteth too much, if, if you know what I mean. If, you know no, what I mean? no, like, I believe it. But yeah. I, 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 through, my, question, my question though, to you, Brian, because I'm not going to lie to you, man. I've been a big fan of you for a long time before I even got into opening Anthony. I found you hilarious. You had a lot of, sh you know, I mean, you were drinking a lot of that time period, you know, while yeah. you were doing that podcast. And, and I mean, sometimes it's okay, but long, you know, when you look back at it, I'm sure you regret some of it, you know, to some uh, extent. I don't care. It's fine. I mean, it's, okay. it is, like I have, I mean, I went to rehab uh, voluntarily and the, the reality is like my father was a falling down alcoholic. I'm from a long line of Irish alcoholics and, you know, and the problem with living in New York too is like you don't drive, and especially with my vision. Like I do have a car, but you don't really like you sort of get into these patterns where like we'd always joke like I'm four deep. So it would be like eight o'clock at night, and I've already had like fifteen drinks, and I wouldn't even really realize. I mean, I would realize it, but like you right. get into this, it was became every day, every day, and then I realized if I didn't drink, I would start to, I would throw up, I would dry heave, Shake. I would like. I started, I would have, well, shaking, not so much. I would definitely get, I would have like a little bit of tremor maybe, but for me, it was, it all lived in my esophagus. As a matter of fact, no, um, not with the heart, I, pardon me, not with the heart. You didn't have any heart palpitations or nothing. I mean, well, I mean, I would sweat. I would have definitely, I would have like alcohol withdrawal, but the way it really manifested with me is I wouldn't be able to keep anything down and I wasn't eating anything. So basically all I was like consuming was like maybe some lunch, maybe, and I was drinking a lot and I would throw it up. I became so good at throwing up. I could walk down the street <laughs> and I could throw up twice and you wouldn't even know. I just like, yeah, you know, and just like shoot right. I was like Karen Carpenter, just people right. like, oh, she's skinny. What the? So and I one and then what happened was just one day I told and it was becoming you know it was becoming a, an issue with some I had been a really heavy drinker for years and years but it's becoming yeah. an issue and more than I even realized with you know by my, my with my wife and uh, so one day I said to her and I mean, I tried to stop a couple of days a couple of times and I said listen I know I'm going to I'm going to stop it's going to take but I told her I said I'm going to need like a day or two like it's going to be like a werewolf I'm just going to I'm going to need a day or two I'm going to and thank God I didn't have a seizure and die but I said I'm going to yeah. freak the sick, fuck out but I'm going to just it's going to be fine but I'm going to have to get through this so it may be the kids and you just understand that just tell them <laughs> daddy's going through alcohol withdrawal so um you know 
as they, this is when they're going to be stripping on the moon in 20 years. But uh, so, um, so I go, this is what I'm going to do. So I started like, I just, same kind of thing. I laid in bed, I was sweating. Bleh, 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 bleh. And it was to the point where like, I couldn't even get any water down. So after like 18 hours of just of being completely like, if you've ever been like completely thirsty, like I couldn't even, there's a mm-hmm. hospital right by our house. And I walked down to the hospital and I said to the, I said, I walked up, talk about white privilege. I walked in and I saw <laughs> the nurse and I was like, Hey, I'm having alcohol withdrawal. She was like, okay, you know, sit over there. And they sat over there and they brought over an IV and they put it right in my arm. And within right. like half an hour, I felt fine. And I, they gave me a Gatorade or no, ginger ale. And I drank the ginger Gatorade. Ale. <laughs> For that deep down body, bad memories. <laughs> but uh, yeah. so they gave me this ginger ale and I drank it. And it tasted so good. And I drank it and I was like, oh, I can just. And then I just realized, I'm like, you know what? I am. I just went through that thing. So I called my wife and I was like, you know what? Let's go somewhere for 28 days. Let me just go for somewhere for 20. I don't even know what rehab is and what that means, but I'll go someplace. And she was so funny. She was like, okay. She goes, where do you want to go? And I was like, I don't see that show Intervention. And I was like, I don't know. Like, I think there's a place called like New Promises in Malibu. That sounds nice. Yeah. I'll go on a paddle board or I don't know. And she was like, no, no. So I ended up going to a place called Silver Hill, um, which is where uh, Billy Joel, uh, it's a big famous celebrity, blah, blah, blah. I actually was in a, they have these houses and I was in a house, um, Scabetta house. And I was yeah. in a house and they put you in with all other male alcoholics. And it looks like a ski lodge. This is not on insurance. And they put you in and there's like a cafeteria thing over there and you have to detox. Oh, there are, I already detox. And you spend one day in the psych ward and then they put you into with these guys in this house and everyone's from everywhere. And everyone is either people are either like mortgaging their homes to be there or they're kind of like, you know, just rich shitheads. Right. So, right, yeah. and I'm in the house and it's a house for 20 guys and there's 10 of us in there. And I, they had said they could accommodate my vision, which they could not at all. But I was in the house with this one guy who also w- lived in Brooklyn and he was Cambodian American, which I know he was born here, but I could not understand a fucking word the guy said. <laughs> <laughs> he was like, I work for Google. I work for Google. And I was like, okay. And he was like, we're from Brooklyn, man. We got to make out for each other. I make sure that each other is, is help each other with some variety. I was like, yeah, okay. But he would talk really quickly. So within the first six hours, I say to him, his name was like Zhang or something. I said, Zhang, listen, <laughs> I want to be friends with you. And I am enjoying the fact that you, because he was there for like yeah, a week. Yeah, you want to connect with me. I said, yeah. I get it. I said, but I swear to God, you talk so quickly. I can't understand you. If you could just yeah, an English dog. I could probably deal with whatever this is, but just take it down by a half. And he's like, okay. And he like leaves. And one of the guys in the house comes up and he's like, yeah, Zhang's really pissed with you. And he's like, <laughs> <laughs> How'd you handle that situation? And he goes, and he wants to fight you. <laughs> oh, shit. So in this in this house, you always right. have 24 hours a day. There's like an office with glass, and there's like a, a PhD guy. It's like a captain. Yeah, yeah. Houses, and he just doesn't live there, but there's for 20 there's like two 12-hour shifts. There's always somebody sitting there, and the door's open. You can go in and they, they get meds for people. So I went in. Right, right. And I had already, already pitched a fit because they didn't have any. I need something called a CCTV. There's one right next to me. It's like a big magnifying disc uh, monitor thing. That's how I use for the phones and stuff. And um, they were supposed to have one of those. They didn't have one of those. They didn't have all this other bullshit. <laughs> so I went in to see. And I mean, you know, you're talking about forty thousand dollars a month, right? This is not cheap. And right. so I, I go in to see this counselor guy, and I'm like, listen. And he had already seen, like, he'd heard apparently. I remember Nukes at me. He's like, yeah, Zhang probably has some problems with you. We're going to get him in here to figure it out. So Zhang comes in. And I told the counselor and the Zhang guy, I was like, listen, I don't need any of this. I'm just here to work the program 28 days and, like, get better and just get out of here. Like, I'm not looking for some kind of fucking weird, you know, Jets, Sharks, fucking Tang, Tong, Dynasty nonsense, whatever you're up to. And then the counselor said, well, um, Zhang, have you threatened violence to Brian? Tang goes, yeah, I want to fight him. And I said, I'm not living. Here. I'm not living here, fucking dumb. Okay, like I'm not. Whatever this is, it's not going to get better. And I'm not going to go to some resolution or some bullshit. I'm not. I'm done with this guy. Fuck this. So right. they're like, okay, but these houses. It's either alcohol in one house, opiates in another, um, eating disorder over here, and all the other houses are all. And they don't do men and women. So they're like, what do we? What do we do with Baby Jane? Right. So they're like, all right, Brian, just hang out. And I'm going to like my meetings, my group meetings, and everything. And I'm sitting there with people and people talking about whatever. And um, uh, this one guy, this one guy had Alzheimer's, and he was like, so, but early Alzheimer's. But he'd be like. I'm an alcoholic. And then he'd be like, am I an alcoholic? And we're all like, yeah, I mean, he just told us a minute ago. <laughs> like, okay, mush brain. <laughs> Sorry. 
<laughs> yeah. I'm sure he's doing great now. But uh, in my in my head, I'm like, let this guy drink. Who gives a shit? He's not gonna remember fucking his kids' faces in a year. That's <laughs> so scary, man. That's just scary. Yeah, I know bro. it's the worst way to go. I agree. Um, you know, hopefully he's dead. I guess I don't know. So, anyways, <laughs> so, so they yeah. come over to me and they go, "Listen, we're gonna move you, okay." <laughs> But we're going to put you. We're going to have to put you in the executive house. Now the executive house. Okay, you have these like campuses over here. There's like five, six different independent houses, right? They're all over right. the place. The executive house is its own mansion on the hill, right? And you oh shit! All your treatment in house. You do all your group over there. You do everything in the house, and it's designed for people. There, it's designed for people that are too busy or too famous to be high profile. Involved. With everybody else, right? Right, and right, that, right. That place is one hundred and twenty thousand dollars a month. Okay? okay, they didn't charge me that. They said, "Look, we're going to put you in a room." Okay, so I show up. My room has a fireplace. It has two <laughs> twice a day maid service. There's a private chef who would take requests. My final night there, he made Peking duck because I was like, I like Peking duck. He was like, yes, sir. <laughs> Give me a day, and um. So that's where I did the rest of my, and then there was one woman who'd been living there for six months for depression. I don't even know what that means. So she had been spending $120,000 a month for six months and she just like lived there. It was yeah. the craziest thing. So I was there after 28 days and then my wife came up to visit. I had friends who lived in Connecticut. They would come visit. You could like tell the chef and be like, Hey, I'm having friends come over. Can we do that steak, Diane, with the, with the, with the tips? He'd be like, yeah, sure. I'm like, we'll be in the dining room. I mean, you have to bring it to yourself. It was like a butler, but like, it was really nice. So I did that. And it was funny because once in a while I would go and see the guys in the houses and I would see that Zang guy and just give him the finger. Right. I'd be like, fuck you, dude. Well, I got, Brian, I got a question for you. When you sure. got out of the 28 days, man, yeah. and you came back into reality, you know, society and everything like that. Yeah. yeah. When you saw alcohol being poured in front of you, being drank in front of you, how did you react to that? Did it ever kind of like draw you to the point where you're like, oh, fuck no, I because drink, number one, man. I got out and I went to see a liver specialist and it turns out that I have early, uh, what's it called? I have early cirrhosis. See, that, so, that should hit different. Yeah. Yeah. So it was kind of like, listen, and, and also I don't want to be somebody I'm incredibly stubborn. Like I haven't talked to my father for 32 years and I can't even really remember why, but I fuck him. So like, you know, <laughs> There's a disease called Irish Alzheimer's where you forget everything. <laughs> you forget everything except your grudges. You know what I mean? Right. And, yeah. So I was kind of like, I didn't want to, I didn't want to be somebody because you meet people in rehab. So here's the thing about I think here's what rehab should really be about. You should come out of that and go, I don't know what happened in there, but I don't ever want to go back there again. And you don't yeah. want to be somebody who goes, I've been to rehab two times, three times, yeah, four times. Yeah. I just wanted I wanted my story to be like, I did the 28 days. I came out. I know my family history. I know that I have a pre predilection for this particular disease. And I don't want to be a back and forth guy. I also take something called an abuse, which means if I do drink alcohol, I think like fucking diarrhea shoots out of my ears or something. So like I, I sometimes I feel like my sobriety has training wheels. And but I was for a while I was seeing an addiction therapist four times um, a month. Every week, right. you know, this, he was a guy that used to run the program at Silver Hill. And then he got me down to twice a month. And then I was him once a month and I saw him like a month ago and he's like, I think we're good for six months. I was like, is it me? Like, you know how lonely I am? Like, can, really, Dr. Jamie? I'll lose more weight. So I can be pretty for you. Right. I, I got a question for no, you. No, answer the question. No, I'm, I'm like, I don't take it for granted. I, they might, I don't go to meetings. I could tell you stories about those meetings. No, no, but, no, not that. Not that. I have a, a deeper psychological no, like question for you. Yeah. Oh yeah, please. Oh, go ahead. So you don't drink at all, correct? No. Uh -huh. you, you don't drink at all. No, I don't. So my question is this though. Do you think you really conquered alcohol when you can't drink it at all, or else you think it might trigger you, or is when you can drink it and enjoy it and know you're not gonna fall into its same trap, but just enjoy it for what it is? When do you well, really conquer alcohol? Is it when you can drink it and not be fucked up from it, or is it when you don't want to drink it at all? I think the question you're asking is like someone's philosophy about yeah. it. Thing. Do I think no? Because I think you could start. Here's the thing. Do I think I could go back to drinking and and have and like have a beer and, and be fine and, and run it for a while? Maybe. But I also look at people like even before I quit drinking, like my wife and I would go to dinner and she would have one glass of wine. And I'd be like, what is the point? Like and still in my mind, I'm like, why yeah. drink? I like to get fucking tanked. Like there's it's no the taste. No, you know what I mean? No. Like, if you like, I don't listen. No. Maybe then that may be your thing, but I also don't even want to. I don't want to even find out. Like I don't care enough. If I drink, I want to get 
exploded. Up, That's yeah, the yeah. fun thing for me. Like that. And I don't mean like, I don't, cause in the end I would black out all the time, but like, that's the fun for it. It's the it's the anxiety that it releases. It's the so I know that it. I don't want to let the, I don't want to let that tiger out of the cage. You know what I mean? Like plus I'm fucking I'm gonna be fifty one in two months. Like no, you I had, I had a good it's, run. It's the whole thing. Like one is too many and ten is not enough. Is like an I'm old like, adage. Yeah. yeah, and it's like and and if you take a long time off and you go back to it. Like if you were a chronic alcohol user and then you yeah. take a take time off and go back to it, it hits way, way harder. Like your body I mean, thinks you're dying again. So yeah. like instantly you'll be fucked up. Yeah. And also they would say you pick up right where you left off. So exactly. and, no sure. say, having said yeah. that, there are people like my wife who will have a glass of Pinot Noir when we go to dinner and people could drink around me. People can, you know, by the way, I'm pretty California sober. Like I've done mushrooms in Puerto Rico. So like, I'm not like, I mean, I can, I, I can still mix it up, but I just don't mess with alcohol and pot is not my thing. How, listen, I got time for like another one or two and I really should go. Cause I, okay, okay. Cool. I got a cool question then sure, what's you, up? Ryan, real quick. So it has sure. to do with MLC then. Yeah, so yeah. what happened between you, like you and Kevin that got you far? Cause like, as a fan, I always kind of wonder why you disappeared from that Super show. Quick, and I would say it if it was the case, I did not get fired. Okay. Here's exactly what happened. I'm working with Kevin. We're a compound media. There is a guy in the in the, the morning show called Bill Schultz. Okay. Mm -hmm. And I'm friendly with Bill. I would do the show. And Kevin wanted us at he wanted Burning Bridges. He wanted more time on compound media. And he wanted Bill's morning slot as our slot. Because Kevin, I don't know if you listen, Kevin can go on for 12 hours. So he always Kevin was on, on the afternoon. He never took a morning slot. Well, I'll tell you why. So he was so he was advocating. There's a guy named Keith the Cop, okay, and Keith the Cop at that time ran Compound Media, and Kevin was was really advocating for Bill's and her name is Joanne, the co-host. He wanted Bill and Joanne's slot, and he would go, "I want their slot, I want their slot," and he would say in these emails to, to Keith, "They're not funny, they're not funny. You should fire them. You should fire them." Now again, I understand how wrestling and is not dissimilar from these podcasts and things like that but like you don't fuck with somebody's money you know what i mean like you don't try to take yeah. someone's job if if keith the cop decides on his own that bill and joanne's show isn't funny and he wants to give us their morning show that's different than kevin hammering at keith in his fucking asperger way and going like i want bill's job i want bill's job i want bill's job bill sucks bill sucks bill sucks bill sucks and saying on our show Bill's terrible, Bill's a faggot, Bill's a this, Bill's a that. So, and I would just sit there. And again, I knew that what Kevin was saying to Keith, and I didn't like a lot of, I didn't like a lot of that. But then Bill one night was fucked up and he basically went on some sort of social media and he was like, Kevin, I'm going to make a smash cut of all the times that you use the N word. He was, he was saying to Kevin, I'm going to get you canceled, right? Now, Kevin, by the way, like, is and he's another one of these guys that is incredibly and he has he's he has a he has a really thin skin right hey and Brian, real quick i got a question for you sir real sure, quick before sure. you continue on with this can i ask uh -huh. you one more question after this and then we're done yeah, yeah that's fine that's fine sure so perfect what kevin did was he goes kevin's like a real paper tiger okay and so kevin says to me can you believe what bill did bill went on and he mm -hmm. said he's going to do this thing and I, I know bill bill can barely fucking send a text message other than and he doesn't have it in him to take to do edits of these things and put together this end bomb end bomb end bomb end bomb so and so i said to kevin i'm like listen you can't get upset with him because i know that you are trying to steal his job and you're going to keep it's time for, yeah get him fired and it's you can't you shouldn't be doing that so you should let's shut up about bill if keith wants to give you his the morning show that's one thing but until then like stop trying to get the guy fired because that's what he's trying to do and everyone knows it and you're saying it to me and it's just it's tacky like come on it's enough because it, you know so so then i met i met lunch with joe de rosa and um <laughs> his mother and his father and oh god yeah. man, this black <clears throat> comic uh m something i forget her name she's always on marina Jersey. yes that's right marina hey. right. we're all in lunch right we're at a place like called that. frost it's an italian restaurant in brooklyn and i had agreed to do bill schultz's morning show okay and i had said bill i'll do your show sure come on because when i'm on the <laughs> show one it's better for us and i have nothing i can i don't even need to talk about kevin i can go on i can be funny hey by the way check out mlc check out burning bridges it's right. i can promote our it's stuff plug without getting into your 
you know, stuff with Kevin and blah, 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 fired and all this. I can totally dance around all that. Who cares? Right. So Kevin calls me, which is unusual because Kevin and I never talk unless we're doing this show. He calls me. He goes, I hear you're doing Bill's show tomorrow. I said, yes, I am doing Bill's show tomorrow. You can't. I said, what do you mean I can't? He goes, you can't do the show because he's trying to get me fired, blah, blah, blah. I said, Kevin, number one, I'll do whatever I want to do. Okay. Like, honestly, like I, if I want to do Bill's show and if I have to explain to you that for the shows that you and I are doing, it's good for me to do other shows on compound, then you're letting your own insanity get in the way of the bigger picture here. So I got to let you know, I'm doing Bill's show. Okay. Well, if you do Bill's show, we can't, I'm going to fire you. And I said, you can't fire me. I, because I'm not going to work with you. You're, I'm going to do Bill's show. If you're saying I do Bill's show, we're not going to work together anymore, then that's fine. That's fine. Whatever. I'm still going to do Bill's show. Okay. Like I'm not going to set the precedent of this relationship where you can tell me what shows to do because of your trying to get people fired and all you this. You become his life. bitch then. Yeah. I, and also like, I don't like what he's up to. And it's just, you know, like I don't, it's, it was all becoming a lot anyway. You know what I mean? So, and I was, and, and mind you, I was making in the neighborhood of, five or six grand a month. So I, I was walking away from money, you know? So I just said, listen, I'm going to do Bill's show and that's it. If you don't want to work together anymore, that's fine. Whatever. It's fine. No problem. That's it. Hung up. And then I went back to the table and Joe's like, who's that? I'm like, it's Kevin. I'm like, I think I'm done working with Kevin. Like, oh, okay. All right. We'll have the big clamps. That's it. And then it turned into, I got fired and this and that. I didn't get fired. I didn't like what he was up to. And that's what that was. So. And, gotcha. Yeah. And if I did get fired, look at me. I'm sitting here with no shirt on talking about moving someone's dick up. So I could, you know, I mean, who cares? Oh, and you live in a beautiful home uh, in, a in New York. Yes. You don't, no, no. You, yeah. You're doing good for yourself. And, and you look great, right. by the way. You look great. Right. Come on, but baby. Thank my, my other question, though, for you, though, sir, is this. When you were doing MLC, you know, just you guys were at the heyday. You guys had like yeah, it was Eddie fun. Murphy's brother on and all this crazy shit. You had Chris yeah. Farley's brother and all this crazy yeah. shit on. You yeah, know yeah, what I'm yeah. saying? You guys were killing it. Yeah, it was great. And then you see the show now, and I'm sure you've seen it recently. No, I, I honestly have not. Because they tried to get you on at some point. I heard about that. They tried to get you on. You talked to the producer, but you were sick at that point, right? Adam's my producer also for, the, for, for, for MLC. And I was scheduled to do the show like six months ago, and I legitimately got – some sort of a stomach thing. And I called Adam and I was like, look, I'm throwing up. This is embarrassing because I know it's kind of a, it's going to seem like I had this, this thing. And, and Adam was like, don't worry about it. And then since then, there have been three times that I've been scheduled to go on MLC. And one time some guy got beat up with nunchucks by somebody. Another time they, they canceled me. So three times I've been like bumped, which is fine, but I tried to do it, but it hasn't. The one first time was definitely on me, and since then I've tried to do it, but I've been rescheduled, and I will continue to try to do it. But but, but my thing is this though, man. Like you, you, I'm sure you like. They've been talking to you about it. You've been seeing what's going on with Kevin Brennan. What's you know, you you understand what's going on with like an aspect of the show. Well, I mean, how I, you see the show now compared to when you guys were doing it. What's the difference that you're you know your takeaway from it? Because it's totally different from when I listen to you you and Kevin okay. Brennan back in the day to now. It's a totally different show. Well, like, okay, I don't know your your show, right? But I right. only like a show. I mean, during COVID was different, but I like being in the same room with the person. You know what right. I mean? Right. And when we did the shows with Kevin and the guests, they always came into the studio or they went to the comic strip. And it was very much like, let's have a comic on and let's do this show. And it'll be Dante Nero or the Farley guy or uh, Ophira or whomever, right? And it would be Sue Costello or that horrible Greek woman or whomever. And it would be like, it would be people in a room and it was kind of like, it, it was like Kevin's friends from the Boston comedy in the early days of the cellar. And they'd come on and everyone's kind of like, Oh, Kevin, you're, you're a crazy guy. And then over the course of like a year and a half, you know, Kevin became, you know, more and more into his own head and people, it was less fun. And it was more about the feuds and the fighting and, and so the drama the drama and look kevin's a brilliantly funny guy and i'm sure the shows are still funny in their own capacity no, they're garbage now bro well i'm just whatever they are people still like them so let them like oh, them yeah, 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 yeah. the shows that we did were entirely they're different. brilliant just by well i had fun it was fun and i enjoyed doing them and and frankly give myself a little stupid plug i mean the, the show that I do with Adam, we have a lot of fun and sometimes we have guests and they're good right. on the thing and sometimes we don't and you know I'm if they were they were fun and I'm enjoying it. I'm glad people had a good time with them. And but I I'm done with them. And you know whatever Kevin's up to now is whatever he's up to. And if I come on, 
I'm sure, look, all I, all I, I mean, one of the things I can say is like of all the co-hosts or sidekicks or whatever you, that have been in Kevin's orbit, I hung in there the longest. You know what I mean? And I knew that we were doing something that people really liked and I had a lot of fun doing it. And, you know, I kind of look at that like people are like, how many tours did you do in uh, Vietnam? I'm like, well, I was in the Delta fucking penance. You know, I'm like, I did four. You know, I used to I used to rape skulls just to get hard. I don't know. You know, so I'm like, I'm well, out. What I heard the biggest thing was what Kevin said was the biggest thing. The issue with like you and Lenny was you guys didn't want to make money on the show for the most yeah, that's part. That's not the case. Listen, Kevin can say whatever he likes and I'll agree with whatever he says. But Kevin's batshit crazy and he's the first to admit it. And whatever he perceives is whatever he perceives. But like I was making money. I thought one thing that was always great about Kevin is I made 40% of the revenue from MLC and I got paid a, a per show fee to do burning bridges. And the money was always on time and it was always down to the penny. Kevin was always, he was, always, I never had to worry about getting paid with Kevin. So Kevin was always good about the money. And I was, I would have, I would have done, listen, if, Keith the cop would have come to me and said, I, I want to do, I want you guys to do mornings. As long as that didn't mean if they were moving Bill somewhere else or it meant that they were going to open up Saturdays or Sundays, I like to do the shows. I would have done more shows for more money. Lenny, I, I don't know anything about Lenny. I've never met the guy. So, right, well, right, right. But, I mean, he was you know. the first guy that got destroyed by Kevin. And then, yes. he, and then, yeah. he had to be, and then Jimmy Martinez replaced him, right? Uh, yeah, I guess. I don't know. I don't know, though. Again, I only knew, I didn't even know Kevin was doing a podcast. I only knew hearing him on. Uh, Opie and Jimmy, and then I went. The first time I even knew about his show was when I was the guest on the show. Anyway, so that's it. Um, listen, you guys, this has been a lot of fun. So thank you for having it's me on. Really brilliant. Brilliant. It's amazing, bro. Awesome, thank awesome you. having you on. Like I said, I'm an OG fan from thank you, Jim and Eddie. But you, we really covered a lot in this interview. So yeah, yeah. really appreciate you coming on, man, and uh, all you. the best to you. Brian, do you have any plugs you want to give out, buddy? Any Pornhub links? Any plug. Plug. links? <laughs> you want a milk jug plug? No, I'll do it, bro. What's up? Yeah, you know, you know, it, it's just watery triple sec. Uh, you know, <laughs> yeah, it's always thinking of my own my bitch tits. Um, so, no, listen, the Patreon is the most fun, obviously, and that's the uh, Brian McCarthy on Patreon and Brian M. Show on all the platforms and on YouTube. It's Brian McCarthy Interview Show. And you can either like it or, you know, all the usual things that it's good for, to do for the show. Thank right. you for having me. Please, when this is archived or whatever it is, send me a link. You have my email address. And um, maybe at some point, are you guys ever in New York? Uh, uh, so from time to time. Depends. All right. Well, uh, we'll see the yeah. <laughs> I am. Uh, I'm famous. My wife will tell you. I'm famous. <laughs> I shouldn't say that. What I meant was I'm famous for having for when people come into town, like, look, Chad Zumak live with me. You know what I mean? Yeah. But, uh, or stay with me. Jesus but, Christ. I know. It's ridiculous. I remember one time, though, we had this, uh, there, was, there was this guy from Australia who yeah. hit, he was like, I'm in New York. I'm a big fan. I'd love to meet you. I was like, yeah, who are you in town with? He's like, my wife and kids. I'm like, come out to Brooklyn. I'm up a pizza party. Oh, my fuck. wife from work. There's this two, this guy and his wife. And uh, <laughs> it's funny because I had my, uh, I mean, this may be a deep cut, but I had my my um my my bookshelf out and he comes over and goes brian do you mind if i take a picture next to the nazi books and I said, sure. <laughs> <laughs> all right guys listen thank you very much i love okay. you buddy you're fucking awesome you, you, thank you for all this i'm just gonna walk away i don't have to turn this off so love you bye later bro bye, bye. buddy see you later man. all right what a show what that a was show. the one and only brian p mccarthy go check him out he's doing a youtube show like you said he's uh pumping his patreon uh, a yeah. man who is never short on words. So it was a great interview, Mir. And he was, uh, a, he, was a, he honestly was probably one of my most favorite guests. He's down to earth, a true man's man. Uh, and we <laughs> have so someone funny. tomorrow, correct, Doctor Chow? Yeah, we're having uh, AJ Benza tomorrow around the same time. So Howard Stern uh, slash um, New York City legend as well. So oh yeah, that's gonna be a fun one. So everyone tune, tune in, in for that one. Peace out. Peace everybody. out, guys.